Welcome to the Student Success Formula Summer Summit 2020. This is Saturday the 29th of August and it is five past five. So many of you have come to join us to discuss this topic and the main topic of discussion this evening is breaking barriers of inequality within the UK education system. That is the main topic of discussion and um, I just wanted to um, you know, um, share a little bit about myself. Um, I put out a YouTube video this week. I was prompted by one of the ladies who had registered and she said, Emma, what's your bio? And um, in that YouTube video, I shared a bit about the inequalities that I've experienced, the challenges that I've faced um, with, from um, educators. And it's been a very difficult experience because um, at times I didn't know how to challenge or what to do to deal with these situations. Um, I was very blessed and very lucky in the sense that um, I had a mindset that I wasn't going to give up. I wasn't going to um, throw in the towel. And I, um, I had a sense of belief in myself, even when I didn't see the manifestation of great ability. Um, I'm here today as a qualified doctor. I'm a GP registrar working in South London. I'm from Brixton. My family is of Jamaican heritage. And um, I, I'm here today because of the grace of God, but also because of that tenacity, that grit that is within me. Now, some of the topics we'll be discussing, we'll be looking at what we can do um, as as individuals, as the student, as the parents, as the community, as the families, um, as the teachers, the schools that are supporting young people, particularly young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. So we'll be looking at what we can do, but I think it's also important to recognise it's not just us or the individuals who are facing inequalities that makes up the equation. There's a wider issue and we should also start to think about what can be done outside of us and how we can broach this discussion and how we can move things forward. Because when I released my video um, during the week, I received so many um, responses from people who are probably in their 50s saying they experienced inequality like what I described when they were younger in the UK and they were surprised that I would, had been experiencing the same things. So um, this is an interesting discussion because now 15 years after secondary school, 16 years after leaving secondary school um, and hearing and seeing some of the same inequalities that that students are facing and I'm like why is this still happening and for many years I was too scared to challenge it and to speak out about it for fear of retribution in my career um, and how that may impact me but I've I've come to the realization that I've been given this platform, I've been given my, my name, my, um, my title as doctor, and I can't just have it for myself, I need to use it to help other people. And that's been my passion, to reach back and help students who were probably similar in similar positions to what I was in, um, and facing some of those same inequalities. So that is the reason behind this summit today. Thank you for joining us, there's 60 of us in the room. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, just in terms of the ground rules, just to let you know that we are recording. Um, it's not live, but we are recording. And um, therefore, if you can keep yourself on mute, um, that will be very helpful to avoid any unnecessary disruptions. Also, if um, you can feel free to um, um, stop your video sharing, or if you want to share your video, you can. So it's up to you, okay? Um, we have some amazing panelists. I'm gonna move right on. Um, and so Nigel, if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay. So, I mean, today, I, you know, I, I, I was up very early and um, my phone was buzzing crazy. And um, many of us will know that we received the very sad news um, that an amazing, brilliant actor, um, Chadwick Boseman, passed away and I think he was only 43. Um, 
he um, was the star of a number of movies, but um, most recently, many of us will remember him from Black Panther. Um, and, you know, when we think about his life and we realize that he was battling bowel cancer for four years, um, and no one really knew apart from obviously his family and his close circle. Um, and we see that he was able to produce so much in the midst of so much trial and f uh, such a fearful situation, a fearful circumstance he was experiencing, but yet he was able to bear down and produce some of the best movies and leave such an amazing legacy. And as such, it is fitting and it is right for us to take time just to acknowledge the man that he was and to pay respects to him. And there was um, a, a tweet and a message that I, I saw today and I thought it was, it was, it explains why there is so much, um, so much sadness and so much um, feeling and love that, that the community that people have for him. Um, so this person um, was saying that some people might be confused um, why the black community are devastated behind Chadwick Boseman's death. And they go on to say, let me explain. Chad played roles that embodied the true essence of who we as black people are. He didn't take the traditional slave roles or roles where we overcame being black or the gangster role or the crackhead role. Chad embodied the true essence of who we are as black people. We are lawyers breaking back barriers, Thurgood Marshall, we are talented athletes, 42 and the Express, we're singers and songwriters, get on up, last but certainly, certainly not least, we are superheroes, Black Panther. This is the true essence and a mere glimpse of who we are as Black people. To lose a person, a legend, an icon who embodied these roles to showcase for the world to see hits home for all of us taken from us so young, but your memories will more than certainly live on. May God take your pain away and you rest in heavenly peace. And so we just take this time just to honor the man that he is, the man that he was, um, the legacy that he's left. And there's so much we can draw from his legacy. Um, just realizing in hindsight what he did whilst he was going through what he was going through even in the, i understand that you know in in the recent um months and weeks he was even being bullied because he was losing weight no one knew that he was losing weight because of cancer um and so there's so many things we can learn from this um and it's so interesting the characters he played and who he was and how that links in with our discussions today when we're talking about inequalities and our discussion today is not just about black people and inequalities black people face our discussion today is about students from disadvantaged backgrounds that that there's a range and we're going to explore that so without further ado let's um continue on and let's start session one Okay, um, Nigel, if you can scroll, um, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, so session one, this is um, session one where we're gonna be um, tackling the racial and socioeconomic inequalities in um, education. And we're also gonna talk about attainment gaps. We are gonna be talking about social mobility and university access. We'll be um, discussing representation and access of black people in teaching and academia, okay? Um, we have got some really amazing panelists. Um, I will um, just start off by having introduced myself to you. My name is Dr. Emma Blake. Um, I'm a GP registrar. I'm also the founder of a social enterprise called Student Success Formula. And um, I'll just read a bit about my bio um, to you. So. Um, I have experienced being told that I've reached the top of my ability um, when I was once underachieving and um, I have a passion to help students fulfill their potential. I'm the founder of a, of a social enterprise called Student Success Formula, which offers high quality online science tuition to students aged 11 to 16. And along with an accomplished team of qualified doctors, dentists, and medical students, I deliver a unique package 
for the students, um, which focuses on science tuition coupled with relatable role models. Um, I'm also the member of the British Caribbean Doctors and Dentists Network. I'm a Christian. I'm the founder of the Great Kingdom Bible Study um, course, and I've recently released a YouTube video explaining more about the inequalities I have faced within education. Our, our first panellist um, today in this session is Tyrone Sinclair. So Tyrone says, hi, my name is Tyrone and I'm an assistant head teacher in South London where I was born and raised. Despite struggling with dyslexia, I hold a first class degree in criminology and educational studies from Keele University, a PGCE in religious education from UCL Institute of Education and also a master's in educational leadership and management from the University of Warwick. I specialise in safeguarding and mental health, behaviour management, exclusions and student movement, inc inclusive education and interventions. I am one of eight children to Caribbean immigrant parents who has experienced the many disadvantages and advantages of the UK educational system. I have worked in inner city London schools for the past 11 years and believe in our young people. I am an avid traveller and have travelled to over 50 countries around the world. I believe traveling has a transformative power and I'm in the process of starting a charity that combines my passions of young people and traveling by taking them, particularly children of the diaspora, to the Caribbean and Africa as an intervention for change. At the beginning of 2020, I took my 13-year-old nephew back to my mother's homeland um, in Grenada for eight months as he was struggling with the UK school system. I'm immensely proud of the progress this young man made despite the many disruptions COVID-19 caused. He transformed within an environment that supported him. I am passionate about inspiring our young, our young people to tap into their unknown potential and make them aware that there are spaces where they can feel seen, heard, appreciated, accepted and ultimately loved. That's Tyrone Sinclair. Our next panellist is Andrea Yanka. Andrea is a lecturer and a PhD student with a passion for a smooth transition and good outcomes at university for all students. For some, university is just another step in education. Other students, i.e. those from minority backgrounds, mature students, etc., are faced with a plethora of issues that their peers are not, resulting in a very different experience. Andrea returned to higher education as an adult without any prior desire to stay. During her study, she began to notice the inequalities that exist in higher education. And when she began working as a lecturer, she understood even more the need for reform practices. To this end, Andrea's PhD investigates ways in which universities can afford equitable practices for all students to ensure everyone is getting a fair chance at university. Andrea is writing a book aimed at supporting students with their preparation, transition and progression through their studies. University is a unique experience that can reap rewards beyond a qualification. Many people, though through no fault of their own, do not know how to make the most of this experience. Andrea is passionate about leveling the playing field. Then we have, um, then we have Tamara Achampong. So Tamara says, my name is Tamara and I studied psychology at the University of Warwick, graduating last year. This autumn, I will be commencing my master's in psychology and education at the University of Cambridge. The way children and young people learn fascinates me and I am particularly passionate about educational inequality, attainment gaps and the disproportional characteristics that may perpetuate academic outcomes, i.e. resilience. Pre-COVID, I also enjoyed salsa dancing in my spare time. And Tamara can be found on LinkedIn. Next, we have Shakira Beresford. Shakira says, I am a head of English in a West London secondary school who is actively committed to developing my craft, young people and myself. Then we have Elaine Cunningham. Elaine Cunningham Walker is a Forbes and Tatler featured educational strategist. She is the mother of two award winning children who were endorsed by Mensa when they appeared on the Channel 4 series Child Genius in 2015. Elaine's experience in raising genius children led to 
um, mothers worldwide reaching out to her asking how they can be um, how they can get the best out of their children at home and within the field of education. Elaine began helping parents to channel their children's energy into extracurricular programs, providing them with opportunities to develop their skill set and fundamentally assisting with the application process to get their children into the best schools. Elaine is the founder of Everything Education, which is an educational consultancy that deals with the whole child, putting together a SWOT analysis for your child and matching them with the right school and university. They have relationships with several schools in the UK and the USA. They also have relationships with tutors and universities. Right, so that is our panel. That is our panel for this session. Okay, guys? So we're ready. We're ready. We're ready. Okay, so I'm, I want to, um, if we can um, unshare the screen, and um, we're going to go to Andrea first. Andrea, can you, um, we're just, just going to start from the basics. Andrea, can you tell us what do we mean by inequality? Hello, everybody. Um, good evening. Hope you're all well. So um, I guess the typical definition of inequality is that there are unfair situations that allow some people to have more opportunities over others. And that is, in effect, what inequality means. There are things that are set in society or in place in organisations that makes it easier for some people to access it than others. You're on mute, hon. Thank you. <laughs> and um, thank you, Andrea. And Tamara, building on that, then how would we then describe educational inequality? Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, so, educational inequality is in essence uh, Thank you very much. Um, Sorry, if everyone can be on mute, please. Oh, um, so it's the unequal distribution of um, resources kind of in education. Um, so kind of the first level we see kind of unequal distribution of resources kind of in the school. Um, but then this is also brought broader in kind of the child's or children's learning environment. So this could be in the home. Um, so in terms of kind of educational inequality broadly, um, it basically means that children from low income or less um, advantaged backgrounds um, are likely to have less, less access to the kinds of resources um, that will benefit their education as those from higher income or um, individuals from higher resource backgrounds. Thank you. Thank you. And Tyrone, in practice, what what does this look like when we talk about education inequality you know you work in a school you work with um students who um, ex um get excluded um what what does it look like in practice can you give us an example yeah i think um malcolm x famously once said that uh education is a is a passport to the future um but it, often we find that sometimes some passports are more valuable than other passports. And in one of the ways that you see that, where you see the inequalities in particular, um, is with the exclusion rates. And that's for particularly uh, young black kids. Uh, they are excluded at a far higher rate. Um, and that's an example of how it actually plays itself out. Okay, thank you. And this is, I guess, another question for you, Tyron, would be, if a colleague, an, an educator, might not be a teacher, but someone working in a school, um, noticed that their, their colleague was expressing or maybe showed signs of some kind of prejudice but, um, or um, some making generalizations, how would you suggest someone could challenge that with a colleague? I definitely think um, we are in quite a unique space at the moment. Things are very live. I think everybody can agree that 2020 has been an incredibly difficult and challenging year, um, to say the least. However, one of the things that it has done is it's afforded a lot of people an opportunity to voice, to stand up and express their exhaustion, their tiredness, uh, their confusion, and the range of emotions that we've all possessed with what's essentially been going on uh, with the experiences of Black people. Um, this is a, a, a good time now more than ever to hold people to account. 
Because one of the things that we are seeing is that people collectively are tired. They're fed up with the microaggressions. They're fed up with the stereotypes. They're fed up, fed up with the very insidious ways that uh, inequalities and racism seeps, it seeps its way in, that therefore sometimes make it a little bit more difficult to challenge it openly. But what we've got to do is be bold and stand up united and say, this is not okay. And it's not okay for you to do that. Now, if that person doesn't receive that and understand that, uh, there are channels and there should be channels. And this is the time where we are holding our leadership, we're holding our schools, we're holding our institutions to account of not only is it in an individual level anymore, where an individual teacher can no longer be not racist, but how are you as a school actively being anti-racist? What policies do you have that make that particular behavior not conducive for your learning culture and environment? So that's what I think we need to do. We need to speak up. We need to talk about it. You need to bring it. If you feel that it's necessary, you bring it as high as it needs to go. But we need to talk. That's really good. Thank you, Tyrone. That is that is really good. I mean, as a as a healthcare professional, as a doctor, um, when I see inequalities or I see prejudices, um, it is my duty um, to take a stand and actually say well actually my colleague is, is is the same level as me or they might be a consultant but actually I'm I'm in a better position to challenge incorrect ideas about a patient than the patient would be and so I think it's the same within education and and we're just talking about inequalities in one system in the education system but we have been seeing inequalities um, presenting themselves and coming to the fore in um, healthcare, um, in economics and so this is one area that we're dealing with today but it's definitely an area that affects all of us. We all have a family member who is, is going through education or we ourselves have been through. Um, can I ask Shakira and Elaine, when we say the term students from disadvantaged backgrounds, what are we talking about? Um, are we just referring to students who are eligible for free school meals or does it, is, is it more than that? Can I go to um, Shakira first? Hello, um, hi everyone. Uh, so, um, okay, so disadvantage, um, it can, no, in answer to your question, whether it's just children who have access to free school meals, no, that's not the case. Um, they, uh, uh, these issues who do um, kind of have, uh, kind of come from low income families, um, they can also um, be looked after children or children who um, perhaps have, um, have less um, um, support in the home, uh, but also students um, who, you know, parents are uh, within the armed forces, uh, who move around. So disadvantage um, is, is essentially anything that, that prevents um, a student to have a steady um, access uh, to... Uh, a, a okay, thank you, thank you. And Elaine, is there anything you wanted to add to that or...? When we talk about students from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, you know, what, what is that including? Um, I think the word disadvantage is, is quite loaded because a lot of people assume that if you're disadvantaged, you're from a particular postcode. But I think I, I said to you the other day that there are a lot of children who are in very good schools and very, very quite privileged schools but they're, they're in there because they're in there on a scholarship and their parents might be working all hours good sense in like two or three jobs. So that could look, be, look, could be seen as having a disadvantaged background. Even though you're going to one of the best schools, you haven't got the parental support that's needed in order for you to move to the next level. And I think that parental involvement in um, educational attainment, because you spoke about the, 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 the divide in education attainment is something that's really critical in, in this kind of discussion because number one I might go to an amazing school but I might not have the support in order to achieve what I need to achieve to grow my confidence to grow my self-esteem to grow my belief systems all of these things are very very relevant Thank you, Elaine. That's a really good point. I mean, sometimes we forget about those children who are in private schools or in really good um, state schools, and actually 
their parents are working all hours to, to help them stay in that in that place so um, that's a really good point thank you um, and so we've we've talked about we've touched on this a bit but Andrea what role do you think socioeconomic background and class plays um, on the um, the attainment of students what role do you think socioeconomic um, plays on inequalities and educational inequalities that a student might experience? Okay, um, I think as um, Elaine, I think, just said, she sort of hit the nail on the head there. Um, <clears throat> I think from the perspective of higher education, as in students who are at university, um, I've sort of broken it down to three points. So I think the first thing is children who tend to come from um, disadvantaged backgrounds or low socioeconomic backgrounds often have to work whilst they're at university. Um, whereas their counterparts who are not from those backgrounds possibly don't. And I think that people underestimate the impact that that has on those students. Students have to um, be able to afford to pay their rent, to be able to um, get around, um, afford books, afford other experiences that their peers might have. And they have to work to do that. Um, so whereas their peers might have six hours in the evening to study for an exam or to prepare for an assignment, they might only have two or three because they have to work in order to pay their way. Um, that leads on to another point, which I think a lot of people underestimate the power of networking at university, um, doing internships and getting in with certain crowds or societies and so on and so forth. So again, if you're having to work whilst you're at university, you don't have the same opportunities to access those um, resources, to access those other people and to network with those people. Um, the ability to do paid, paid uh, unpaid internship whilst you're studying, uh, particularly if you are in a um, particular background. For example, my sister is currently doing her degree in architecture and we're having a conversation. I said to her, you know, it'd be a really good idea for you to get into an architecture firm and do some internship. And she's like, yes, but I'm struggling because I have to work. Um, whereas her peers might have them the whole day to do that. She doesn't have that opportunity. Um, and I think the other thing is, especially if you're children of immigrants or children of parents who do not have a history in higher education, a history in, at university, is not really understanding how the system works. University is a very different experience to college um, and to school where you have been taught pretty prescriptive ways of um, existing in education and doing your assignments. And the teacher says this and you do that. University is very different. And I think a lot of people are unprepared for that transition. Um, and their parents may not have done that or nobody else in their family may have done that and they're having to field that in the context of everything else that they are dealing with and I think that um, is probably the top three things the loads the hundreds and hundreds of reasons but I think that's the three that I'll touch on for now Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, Tamara, I wanted to ask you about attainment gaps. Can you just explain briefly what, what do we mean by attainment gap? And then Elaine, I'm gonna to come to you afterwards. Like how can we narrow that attainment gap? Um, so attainment gaps, kind of what, the ones that exist in the UK and many other countries, um, is in essence basically seeing differences in educational outcomes between different groups. Um, so generally you see students from lower income backgrounds or from backgrounds of disadvantage doing worse than those from more privileged backgrounds. Um, in terms of why they exist or different things that can play into that, I think Andrea touched on loads of the key things there. Um, and I think for me, I kind of see it at, I guess, three kind of levels. Um, we kind of have the individual level, um, so that could be differences in things like um, um, resilience, self-esteem, um, and these kind of factors that kind of uh, make it more difficult potentially for children from disadvantaged backgrounds to um, make up make up for the deficits that already exist. Um, then we also have things like on the school level, um, which could play into kind of resources that the school have, um, time, energy, different kind of things at the school level that may also play a role. Um, but then also kind of at another level kind of being social support. Um, so a few things that Andrea mentioned before about kind of networking abilities. Um, Elaine touched on kind of parental support and having people that champion and support and encourage you. Um, so it's, it's, there's so many levels to it and all of these things kind of come together um, in essence. And so it means that children from lower um, income or disadvantaged backgrounds, sadly, um, when they're faced with so many challenges, it makes it that much harder to do well um, because it's, 
I guess some people may have seen this image of kind of the difference between equity and equality um, and kind of equity being that you're going to have people that are already kind of starting five steps behind. So for all of them to reach the same level as someone who's kind of already on this level, it takes a lot more. So it's going to take people um, having to overcome those individual barriers. It's going to take people having to overcome those social barriers, those school level barriers. Um, and yeah, but it's, it's a multifaceted issue. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine, is there anything you want to add in terms of how we can narrow that gap? I think um, there's a proverb that says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. And the, the problem here is not just about social issues and all of those issues. It's because the people that end up not getting the right outcomes do not have the knowledge in order to get them to the right places i'll give you an example so andrea touched on um, networking the problem is that in our community people don't know how to network they don't know how to approach a situation they don't know how to sell themselves and because they don't know how to do that the outcome for the networking is not what it should be um, andrea is her sister is fortunate enough to have somebody like andrea to speak into her and tell her x y and z and then the other thing that tamara spoke about was that you know uh, equality versus equity was that the example that you used and that it there'll be somebody here and it will take more for somebody who's here to get to where they are here the challenge is that from day dot when the child comes out of the womb there are things that parents do not know in order to get them their children at the right level so for example um, when your child is two or three, if your child is swimming, that's a life skill that you're teaching them. But what you find is in our community, a lot of people are not swimming and they're not doing those things. So they, they lack that confidence in the first place because they don't have the same schools as some of their, the same skills as some of their counterparts. And so already in the mind, because you didn't know or your parents didn't know to start this, who is going to tell you this information? How is this information going to be given to you? The, the proverb says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So if you weren't given the knowledge in the first place, how were you ever going to win the race? If you didn't know how to train to be an Olympian, how are you ever going to be an Olympian? Do you understand? So, so yes, we've got all these social problems, but there are some people with a very wealthy parents who were not who were not doing well in school either. Um, I deal with a lot of them. They're not doing well in school either. So, um, it, it, basically, some of it is laziness. But, um, the bottom line is what I'm trying to say is that our community and people who are in and I'll put in quote a deprived from a deprived background, for me. OK, I'm a single mother and the statistics say that a single mother with two black boys, the outcomes are horrendous. I was determined not to adhere to that statistic and blow that out of the water. Yes, I had a very good upbringing. Yes, I had a um, I went to the right schools and I went to the right universities. However, when it came to the fact that I was a single mother, I was still I was still painted with the same brush. So I think we need to bring knowledge to certain communities in order for them to get up to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, we're running behind time here. So there's some areas that I, um, you know, we've talked, we've, we've kind of covered a lot of the areas in terms of um, school exclusions. Um, we've talked about the difference between equity and equality. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about representation and to what degree we think representation in the classrooms and in leadership positions within education is important. Um, and I just wondered, Shakira, like, um, when we talk about representation in the classroom, in education and in academia, like what are we talking about? Um, and what are the various factors that contribute to good representation for students? So, um, you know, sometimes we automatically think of race, but you know, if, if, a, if a teacher is not the same race as the students they're teaching, which is probably majority of the cases, how can a teacher become relatable, be inspiring, and also remain relevant to um, their student? Um, and also when we, you know, on the, on the back of that, I'll go to Andrea afterwards, if you can talk about um, why we're seeing, um, sorry, I might, get Tyrone, sorry, to talk about um, why we're seeing less um, leaders in education who are from BME backgrounds. Okay. Um, 
certification uh, in the classroom and in school, that's to, I'll start with that first. Um, that can mean uh, a lot of things, so I'll, 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 I'll hone in on a few. Um, first of all, uh, I mean, okay, I teach English, um, so representation for a lot of students can be about who they see in what they read um, and also um, in what they see. So um, an example is, you know, the emphasis on uh, the classics and on uh, you know, the Shakespeare's and the, and the Charles Dickens's of the world. And, you know, as a language is quite complex, um, it's very easy for um, staff to go to uh, those kind of 19th century uh, British texts and for students to read those texts because we're focused on students accessing, you know, a, you know, a certain type of, a certain type of vocabulary. Um, but the bottom line is, is that students can see it and they might like it, but they don't connect with it because they don't see anything of themselves and their circumstances in those texts. Uh, that's one thing uh, for uh, kind of a lack of representation in what they see in the classroom. Um, another is um, of, and I guess this kind of ties into, I will be going to ask Tyrone soon, um, is um, really not seeing enough people who look like them, um, you know, who dress like them, uh, in, in positions of authority, right, as teachers, um, as leaders, um, which can be challenging, uh, especially if, I'm trying to be very careful with my words here, uh, but I work with some young people um, who, who unfortunately in the past have expressed that they don't see themselves as leaders. Um, I see it in them, they're, you know, they're feisty, they're intelligent, they're brilliant, but they don't see themselves as being leaders um, and I, I strongly believe that if they, if they saw more people who they could connect to um, being leaders and then you know they'd be able to envision that for themselves. Um, you asked another question as well about um, trying to remove was uh, about how uh, teachers can relate to um, other groups. Um, so of course I mean I'm, I'm, I'm talking about race at the moment, um, you know, um, a range of uh, you know, sexuality. But I think that uh, touch on something very important here when she mentioned knowledge. Now, it's, it can be very difficult for um, anyone to put themselves in the position of another person because they haven't had those experiences. So, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm both Caribbean and I'm Sri Lankan. Um, so, you know, I, I have experienced a range of different uh, struggles as a result of inequalities. I'm trying to choose my words very carefully here. Um, and therefore to understand that when I see young people go through it and I'm able, and I'm able to tackle it and help them to engage in it and to process it emotionally um, and mentally. But if let's say a you know there's a leader or a teacher not come from that very for them to even notice in the first place. Uh, a behaviour like as just play in anger, and not understand it, that deep rooted in that is a sense of injustice. So I think that's very, very important um, as a teacher, a cohort, right? So if you know that, you know, I, I, uh, like a large percentage of students come from a certain school, hello. Shakira, sorry. I think because of the because you're in transit at the moment, the reception's quite bad. So we we're gonna we're gonna come oh, okay. back to you. But I, I caught the points you were making, and they were extremely valid points. Tyrone, if you can kind of um, draw on what Shakira was saying um, about the impact of of poor representation um, in leadership, um, for example, of BME. Um, teachers in leadership what impact does what impact does that have on students and I think Shakira was alluding to that and was and was highlighting that yeah um representation is incredibly important incredibly important um I might I might ask every single one of us in here to do something incredibly just a little bit vain and I hope that people won't leave me out here but I'm gonna ask for everybody that's in here in the chat can you just type this if you're like me you'll understand if you're not like me fine just just let me have my moment but here's the thing when you see a big massive photo or a uh you know like if you were to see your old school photo or whatever it is a big massive group photo 
Who is the first person that you look for when you first see that photo? If your answer is yes, then you're like me. Like, you might need to show me in the chat that, you're, that I'm not alone, but it's so important that when we look back or when we look at things, it's important that we see ourselves reflected. Um, and I know that. I know that uh, it might be a bit vain, it might not be, but I think that this is an example of representation. If I ever see a big group photo, um, the first person that I'm looking for is the person who looks like me. Um, if I see that again in other areas and other spheres, even if I see uh, uh, leadership teams, again, I'm looking for people that look like me. Now, if I'm doing that as an adult in loads of different arenas and in loads of different spaces, how important is it that our young people see and inhabit spaces where they feel represented? It's so important because if we don't have those spaces, it makes us question our existence or our worth. And the, and the further we question our worth and we question our existence, that will play havoc on the way how we see ourselves and how we process the world that essentially that we live in. And I think that so many of our young people uh, uh, are caught in that conflict, so many, for different reasons, but don't see themselves represented. And when they do see themselves represented, is it a representation that they want to align with? Is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? Is it something that... So having positive representation is incredibly fundamental to development. It just is. Uh, if you, you, and you're all, you have to understand there are so many different levels of of uh, disadvantage. And when, when I make the reference of disadvantage, I'm gonna talk about privilege. And uh, the, the, the holy grail of privilege would be a white Christian male who is able-bodied. But every single one of us, it might be from your ability, your race, your class, your gender, um, your sexuality, uh, all of those different things make up sometimes when you don't see yourself represented. So for black kids in particular, if they don't see themselves represented in prominent positions, it can either do one of two things. It could make them want to fulfill that role and want to be that person that's underrepresented, or it can kill a dream for many people to feel like, what's the point, I'm not there. And not all representation is always good representation. That's also part of the problem. So it's about having the right people in positions of influence that create change. That's really, that's really good. I mean, not all representation is good representation. That, that is a discussion for another day. But thank you for raising that point. I want to turn our attention now to a case study. So what we're going to do in these sessions, we're winding down to the end of this first session. And before we get to the q and I want to um, talk to Tamara particularly. Um, many of you may have come across a video that went viral. And Tamara was fundraising um, to help fund her master's degree. Um, I mentioned while reading her bio that she um, has been um, offered a place to study psychology and education at Cambridge University. So Tamara, can you tell us um, a little bit about why you had to resort to fundraising and how that ties in with your background and how that links in with this discussion about educational inequality? Sure. Um, so background wise, um, I'm from a low income household. I was raised by a single mother. Um, I went to a school in an area that was, I'd say, under resourced. Um, and that was kind of reflected in kind of um, the resources we had in school. Um, I think sadly, also in terms of like the aspirations that many of my peers um, had. Um, so not a lot of um, girls from my school kind of aspired to go to Russell Group universities or even university. Um, but there were some of us that did. Um, so you mentioned before I went to the University of Warwick and that's where I did my undergraduate degree in psychology. Um, and I think it was there that, I think my horizons were truly broadened. Um, I think it was there where I think I did face educational inequality. Um, and I think in that sense, it was more, I think the comparison between me and my peers, the things that they knew that weren't taught in the classroom, um, that kind of made me feel in some senses or some circles, a bit inferior um, but as to kind of back to why I'm fundraising and kind of that whole backstory um, so I applied um, for Cambridge and I applied by the December deadline which is kind of 
it gives you access to um, scholarships and all those kind of opportunities. Um, but sadly, I didn't actually hear back from the university itself. Um, and kind of my deadline to submit my financial declaration, which basically says how I'm funding my course, um, was the end of August. Um, and applied for some external um, scholarships, um, but kind of end, of end of July came round and I still had no funding. Um, another thing I don't know if many people know, with Cambridge and Oxford, there are restrictions to your offer. Um, so you're not actually allowed to work. Um, so if you do work, it has to be 10 hours and it has to be outside of term time. Um, but these 10 hours must not contribute to kind of your financial stability. Um, so for someone from a low income background, um, it just makes postgraduate education next to impossible. Um, so for me, I knew that, but I was like, I'm not giving up. This wasn't the end of my journey and I wasn't going to let it be that. Um, I'd heard campaigns of other people who had crowdfunded successfully and spoke to a girl who'd done the same thing. And I was like, okay, Jesus, I'm going to trust you with this. And I'm just going to tell people my story. Um, and it's been amazing to see how I've connected with people kind of in my local community, um, global community, but just people who have similar stories. Um, and I think also kind of in light of kind of the A-level GCSC scandal, I think it kind of put um, a light on the fact that these educational inequalities exist and ultimately we need more people in these kind of spaces. People from low income backgrounds, but people that are just as able um, and just as passionate. Um, so educational equality, that is what I'm all over. Um, and I think in terms of my masters, I hope to really tackle that um, by looking at how we can use psychology to kind of champion and encourage young people. So looking at developing those kind of within individual skills like self-esteem and resilience, um, but also just trying to open more spaces for people like myself. So I think just, yeah, sharing other people's stories really. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, and finally, Tamara, for those who would like to follow your footsteps, and um, be, receive, be in receipt of an offer from Oxford, Cambridge, or attend Warwick University. Can you give us a few tips for those parents listening, those students listening, um, what, what led to your success? What, what are the steps that led to where you are now? Um, the first thing I'd say is social support. Um, so having family that pushed me and encouraged me to do whatever I wanted. So um, Tyrone mentioned before that quote about Malcolm X and seeing education as a passport. That was something my mom drilled into me. She was like, for you, I believe you can do better. And so for me, I think within myself, I kind of developed that resilience and determination. Um, so definitely for parents, I think just encouraging, and inspiring your kids to do whatever it is they want to. Um, and for students, I think if you know what you want to do, you have to go after it. Um, and you can't allow people to make you feel small or make you feel like you're not valid or worthy of being in those spaces. Um, you need to know your worth and say, actually, I'm worthy of being here and I'm going to make the, mess, the best out of the opportunity I have. Thank you, Tamara. Um, so now we're going to open the floor up. I think um, Amaze was collecting any questions that we were getting whilst the, any comments as well, whilst we were um, going through our discussion, our panel discussion. Amaze, it's over to you now. Is there any questions um, that if you got one or two questions that were really, that were common, that came up, would you like to um, go ahead and fire them at the panel? Um, there were more comments than questions. Okay. Um, just to clarify the terminology, deprived background does not have key measurables. It is open for one's own interpretation based on individual circumstances. I think that was more of a comment than a question. I'm not too sure. That's open to anyone to kind of either comment on or answer. Um, I think um, deprivation is a pretty all encompassing term. It means lots of different things to lots of different people. And <clears throat> even from a trying to develop some kind of metrics um, for deprivation, it is deeply entrenched in political kind of um, ideology and stuff like that. So, for example, you have indicators of poverty um, that governments will use to say, oh, we've lifted, you know, so many people out of poverty. Um, and what often tends to happen is the catchment just changes. So what counts as um, an indicator of deprivation changes. So there might be something that this year counts as an indicator of deprivation, but next year will not. 
for example. Um, and one of the um, indicators of poverty is having access to Wi-Fi, um, which is pretty obvious why most people do need the internet to survive. But as you have um, quote unquote open access Wi-Fi, it then becomes a false indicator because the idea would then be, well, you know, your child can go to the library or go to McDonald's and use the Wi-Fi there. Um, however, having a stable home um, very recently was taken off um, the list of poverty indicators. So, um, yeah, it is very difficult to de um, to define what deprivation might be if you're in temporary accommodation, and you're no longer classed as homeless. Um, but as I'm sure anybody in here would agree, being in temporary accommodation is not in itself a stable situation to be in and therefore would make sense to be an indicator of um, deprivation. So um, I can't remember who said it earlier on that free school meals is actually not an accurate indicator of poverty, although that is what you, is used in education. Um, different people don't qualify for free school meals for lots of different reasons. With um, the benefit system, the welfare state sort of being streamlined, so to speak, with um, universal credit and stuff like that, lots of people have quote unquote been lifted out of poverty or lifted out of deprivation um, based on paper, but their actual life circumstances have not changed. So I think as educators and just as human beings, it's important to just recognize that, just to kind of back up that point. And there's, a, there's another question. Um, as a single mother to a five-year-old, I come from a low income background one of six children to a single mother. I am now in a good job. Any advice in what to look for in schools for my daughter, as I'm not sure private is best or attainable and things to ask the teachers, et cetera, and what to look for in a school when she leaves primary. And also, sorry, this is the same question. Anyone on the panel would like to advise their younger selves if they had the chance? I feel like that question, probably Elaine, will be best fitting to answer that one. And my, I, I think that my first question is, why would she think that private school is unobtainable? It's obtainable for everybody. It's there for everybody. You just have to understand. And I say this all the time, and I think I said this to Emma yesterday when we were speaking, that a lot of the education that we are moving in now is about strategy and not necessarily about, um, oh, I'm this clever, I'm, I'm, I'm working at this level because there are children who, you know, I work with lots of clients that you're thinking, how on earth did you get into this school? Strategy, the parents use a lot of strategy. If your child is not doing any extracurricular activities, um, they are not going to shine. Every child that comes to us comes with a gift. So as a parent our role is to identify what that gift is and I always use the um, example of I think it's Rio Ferdinand sorry I don't follow football so um, I think that's his name right um, and he when he was young he used to kick things all the time and they just thought that he was a disruptive child but then they put him outside with a football and realized that he was really gifted and that is the footballer that we see today so look at some of the things that that make your that make your child who they are have they started an um, an instrument? What instrument are they learning to play? Are they are they running? Are they um, playing tennis? Are they playing football? Are they playing rugby? Anything they're doing? Are they are they really good at art? I mean, are they really good at drama? Are they really good at dra dance? Look at all of these things and invest yourself in in making them really amazing at that. Now, I've got a child who I thought you know he's going to be a doctor, Emma. I just love the fact that he was going to be a doctor. He turns around to me about six weeks ago and tells me his biggest thing is to get on The Voice and he wants to be an actor. I was like, child, this I'm an African parent. We, we can't do that. Like, where are we going with this? Um, but I have to, but the thing is, it's, it's, it's something that I've nurtured for him from when he was young. He's always gone to stagecoach. He's always done performing arts thing. He's always been a musician. He's always been the center of attraction. So why did I ever think that he wouldn't say anything else? You know, um, he's a drama scholar at the school that he's at. So I think that my advice to the mother who asked that question is, look at your child, look at the gift that you've been given and nurture that. And even if, even if you think that private school is unobtainable, what you have to do as a parent is to make sure that your child is the best 
at what they are doing. You know what? Because um, at, the Bible tells us that your gift will make room for you. And let me tell you that it's my children's gifts that have opened certain doors for them. There are certain doors that have opened to them that I'm just like, how did we get here? My son went to his school and he was the only boy of color that was playing the viola. And so loads of people are asking us, oh, why is your child, why is your child in the orchestra? I've been auditioning for like two years to get in the orchestra. Well, plays the viola. Everybody else is playing the clarinet. He chose the viola. I had another child. My other child wanted to learn the bassoon. They're not typical instruments that we pick up but it made them attractive to the school and so because of that i was blessed enough to be given certain scholarships to the children certain um, money off the fees and so these are some of the things that we have to know i started this conversation by saying that people perish for lack of knowledge you have to know how to how to almost almost market your child and i say to people all the time that you know we shouldn't look at our children as commodities but that's what they are when they're going into school they are just a number because even if you're in a state school or a private school it's about money for the school it's a business right so what makes me what can my school brag about me you know even if you're in a state school in the worst state school in the world if you get into cambridge they're going to use they're going to put you in the local press they're going to boost up their pr by saying that we've done this they might not have done anything it might have been your parents it might have been tamara's tenacity to get her where she is but you can guarantee that that school is going to claim some part of your success journey so um and what would i say to my my she said what what would i say to my previous self what advice would i give um i think it would be to i wouldn't change anything but i would follow my gut more i wouldn't second guess myself um i think earlier i used to second guess myself a lot just because you know we're in a community where everybody's got an opinion and then you want to sometimes listen to that opinion and i wish i'd just gone ahead i probably would have been further but i am who i am and i am where i am and i'm happy about that amazing 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 um Ameza, i think we're going to move on to session two was there any other pertinent questions or comments that you feel we should touch on before we move on no just some great comments um as opposed to questions okay do you want to read off a couple of them just before we move on yeah sure um so reflecting on our community's view on network i think it's a really good point experiencing and understanding how to connect with the wider sort um with the wider resources and information available if we don't do it ourselves then as mentioned we don't pass that skill set on to our children and with, represent, um, with reference to representation, um, I think that was when Tyrone was speaking, um, someone mentioned that their son had an amazing black male leader who empowered the black boys in particular. Unfortunately, um, he was made to leave. And someone said that's why Black Panther was so impactful. So really great comments there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, Nigel, if we move on to session two, but well, I can't believe an hour has gone by so quickly. I hope you guys are enjoying yourselves. Um, if we can... Hello? Yep. Okay. I hope you guys are enjoying yourselves. Um, we, if we go, yep, we want to session two. Okay. Um, we've got 92 people in the room. Can I just see where people are tuning in from? Do you mind putting in the comments the areas that you're tuning in from? Emma, sorry, I, I was just trying to, can I just make a very, very quick comment because I have to come, um, I, I won't, I, I've removed my name um, just for anonymity, um, I do work in a Russell Group University, I am of colour, Yeah. Um, there is something called widening participation so that if there are um, parents who want their um, children to go into like Russell Group Universities, please start looking up widening participation. I think the community don't know about it. Um, and it just starts to take them into universities whilst they're at school and starts to direct them on things to start doing, especially let's say you want to study economics and things like that. They're going to tell you what things to read, 
who to follow. You really, really need to start following, your children need to start following um, leading academics in these universities, etc. So the, these are the things that a lot of parents don't realize that you need to do if you want to get into these institutions. Once you get there, they're, they're, it's not easy. A lot of our black students that do come through don't actually like the experience they have because you are going to literally be... So the only, the, the only way to say it's the only black in the room in that sense. So I might walk around campus, I bump into them, how are you? And they will say, I hate it here. Okay, so your child has to be extremely strong where they're going to be in the minority. If, you, if they're you know, able to handle them, then fine, go, go for those Russell Group universities. But I do have a lot of students that don't like the experience, can't wait to do their masters at a place that's more sort of accepting of them because we've got situations in quite a few of the Russell Group universities where people are actually saying, why is my curriculum so white? So there's an element of, do you sell out to get to where you want in life? Do you assimilate? It's a, it's a really, really difficult situation. And as staff members to see that, I mean, we have a few black academics, very few. Um, and that is one place as well we need to start pushing our children is into academia because it pays extremely well when you get in there. Students do want to see people that look like them and understand them. And the problem that we have when I challenged our vice chancellor, et cetera, why don't we have more blacks in, in the university is because if you don't start young and start going through private education, go to Russell Group universities, you probably, the chances of you becoming an academic in one of those places is probably pretty slim because they need you to have had that experience, those contacts, have like firsts and things like that, having had, you know, done your PhD at leading institutions. So there's so much and I just needed just to, you know, um, just say that very, very quickly because I might have to come off your second session, but there, there's so much information that we're not given um, and I think, like Elaine's done, I think I might have to go into some sort of um, business where you're advising people because there's so much a lot of these children and parents um, just don't know. Wow, thank you so much, Eth, for um, unmuting yourself and sharing that information and it's something we definitely needed to hear. And I um, shared in my YouTube video that I released um, this week that I myself was part of um, widening participation scheme. I studied at King's College University um, and for many years it was something that I felt a bit embarrassed about. So I'm not sure um, if, if any of you have heard about the extended medical degree program at King's, but it is a um, it was based on the on the research and the understanding that students from um, deprived backgrounds who may only attain C grades at A level, they felt that um, based on research that they were able to do a medical degree and pass through successfully um, with the similar grades um, to those who got three A's who were from a more privileged background. Um, and I remember in the lead up before I went to university, I was attending some of those um, access days. Um, I also um, was fortunate enough to um, go to Oxford um, for their summer school twice. Um, and that also helped to raise my aspirations. So as you described, um, S, that really kind of put me in that path where it enabled me to meet up with some of the people who could point me in the right direction. Um, and it's interesting you talk about academia. That was an area that we couldn't really touch on in great depth in this session. Um, hopefully in session three, we'll touch on a little bit more. And, and if you're around for session three, it'll be good to hear your input on that. Um, but it's interesting you kind of described um, some of the nepotism potentially that might be going on um, based on um, who you know um, and also you described the challenges students face when they are maybe the only person like themselves in that place and I've experienced similar experiences not so much in university because um, by going to the um, 
by going to King's on extended medical degree program, there were like 50 other students from inner city London at the time, um, East London, South London, all over, um, mixture of majority probably of the 50 were black and Asian. Um, and the demographics have changed since because the grade requirements for that um, program have risen as with other grade requirements. But um, at the time, I didn't really feel, I think King's is a very multicultural university, um, firstly, but definitely when I became a qualified doctor and I moved out of London and was living outside in, in, in um, Hertfordshire and I was out of 60 F1 doctors um, in the hospital I was probably one of two black doctors and at some times I did feel like you know you naturally um, kind of you're, you're malleable as a person how you speak how you relate to people but you're not quite the same how you are with maybe your friends that you grew up with um, and you can't necessarily use the same um, language um, or slang and so I did feel a bit of a pressure you kind of don't feel fully comfortable um, so I can relate to those experiences and I guess what you're describing comes down to how we're training in terms of mental resilience and also um, making it, it helping students to be aware of what they're going to face when they go into these environments where they're probably one child like themselves in that new environment and how to have a good sense of identity um yeah so thank you for that input so we're going to move on to session two now um nigel if we can have that slide up can't spot the brush please mute um if everyone can mute themselves please Okay, so um, session two, we're looking at the impact of the COVID-19 lockdown on students from disadvantaged backgrounds, particularly. Um, also, we want to touch on the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement and the death of George, Flo um, um, George Floyd sorry, on students. And also, we're going to look at some of the failures in the handling of the 2020 A-level and GCSE results. So we have some of the same panellists that we had from um, session one, so I won't read over those bios those of you who registered um, before two o'clock today should have received an email from me with the full program so you can look at all the bios there Nigel if you can go to the next page please and we have um, joining us in this session we have some more panelists so Paula Perry um, I'm just going to read her bio for us So Paula is known as the cycle breaking and financial expert. She is a mother, international speaker, mentor, lecturer, educator, um, educator financial advisor, author and founder of You For Us, which is dedicated to empowering families and creating a domino effect that breaks negative cycles of generational poverty in areas such as finance, education, parenting and spirituality. Paula raises awareness about financial literacy and the importance of understanding our financial mindset and has been successfully impacting adults and young people in the UK and internationally with her knowledge and practical tools to create a solid foundation that is important to create a legacy for the next generation. She is also a registered financial protection specialist helping the community put in place insurances to protect themselves and family. Paula delivers an interactive, knowledge-filled and enjoyable presentation on finance and history. She is the co-author of the bestseller book, Black British History, and teaches Black history to Key Stage 3 students, and she is a lecturer on, on a Black Studies course for adults. Paula believes when you have knowledge on positive history, it enables you to believe that you are able to achieve excellence just as the ancestors and others before you have done. Next, we have Jordan Kenton. So Jordan is one of our um, younger panellists, and it's, and it's a privilege for us to have some students with us today. Um, Jordan says, I've just finished sixth form after completing my BTEC business studies course, achieving the A-level equivalent of three A's. My current aspiration is to develop my skills um, in either finance or the IT industry. Therefore, my next step is to do an apprenticeship that will enable me to gain qualifications and working experience. Our next panelist is Dr. Michael Grant. 
So um, Dr. Michael Grant is a consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist and health tech entrepreneur. He says, I feel passionately that young people and families require an expert, comprehensive assessment, formulation, plus and minus diagnosis, and, and psychoeducation. This, when indicated, should be followed by an evidence-based approach to treatment and recovery that really matters to the young person and their family, so that all involved are equally invested. Dr. Grant's training in neurodevelopmental disorder disorders covers a broad range of psychiatric specialties, including forensic, general adult, learning disability, old age, and addiction. To date, he has conducted over 300 autism assessments, and Dr. Grant Grant works on the front line navigating the complexities around autism assessments and the long waiting list for young people. Shortly after he became a consultant in 2018, Dr. Grant founded Wellbeing CV Limited, doing business today as Wellbeing Associates. His education and professional experience includes being a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, a spe on the Specialist Register for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. He has a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, um, his postgraduate training um, in the Oxford School of Psychiatry, Core Psychiatry Training Programme, and postgraduate training at the, the Great Ormond Street Specialist Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Programme. He also has a publication um, a systemic review in the area of mental health and exercise during his time as an honorary researcher at the Institute of Child Health at UCL Great Ormond Street um, Hospital. Our next panelist, I believe, is our youngest panelist. And again, let's celebrate them. Let's encourage them. Um, William um, says that I am currently a sixth form student studying mathematics, further mathematics, physics, and history for A-levels with aspirations of studying mechanical engineering at Cambridge University. I enjoy playing sports and games with friends. Being in the Amos Bursary 2020 cohort, which encourages disadvantaged young men to succeed by giving them opportunities opportunities for professional and personal development. I have learned crucial skills which are needed for the world of work. William was awarded 11 GCSEs with a distinction in personal health and a mixture of nines, which are equivalent to high A stars, eights equivalent to, equivalent to A's, and two sevens equivalent to A, and one six, which is equivalent to a high B. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so there's just a few quotes here that I wanted to draw out um, as an introduction before we go into the questions here. So there's a, a quote from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which said children from the highest income fifth of families spend over 75 minutes more than their peers in the lowest fifth of households. So we're talking about the COVID lockdown period here. And it's saying that in, thir if in 38 days of schools being closed, students in the best off families would have done seven full school days worth more um, Basically, they would have done seven full school days worth of extra learning than the peers in the in the lowest fifth of households in 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 England. Okay. Um, from the Sutton Trust, they said that 50% of teachers in private schools report they are receiving more than three quarters of work back from pupils, compared with 27% of teachers in the most advantaged state schools and just 8% in the least advantaged um, state schools. Um, there is um, some, some evidence that 50% of secondary school teachers cited that provision of tech devices was a way that they chose to help students from falling behind and also they, uh, many of them opted to do a staggered return to school or some kind of summer catch up. So I'm not sure if many, uh, many of you here are teachers, if you can um, verify that, that you are part of that and, and that your schools were able to provide extra equipment for students who were in disadvantaged groups who didn't have access to it. Um, and another quote from the and Trust says that 60% of private schools and 37% of state schools in affluent areas already had an online platform in place that was prior to the COVID-19 lockdown compared to 23% of, of the schools from um, of those from most from the most deprived state schools. Nigel, if we go on to the next slide, please. 
And then we're also going to be talking about the psychological impact of COVID-19. So this was an interesting study that was only released probably um, a, a week or two ago. Um, it was research done by the University of Bristol. And it's this um, infographic here, which actually suggests from their, from their research, they found that students felt less anxious during the lockdown period than when they were in school during November 2019. So they compared this cohort of a thousand students around the Bristol area aged between 13 and 19 and they reported during lockdown they felt less anxious and also more connected to school which is interesting and their research was suggesting that as students begin to go back to school in September that their that there might be a rise of anxiety. Um, and this, this um, clipping um, is something I wanted to highlight because you know, as a result of this COVID-19 period, there was the A-level results fiasco and the grading system fiasco. And this poor student um, was a straight A student. She ended up pen penning a passionate letter to Boris Johnson because she missed out on her dream of a Cambridge offer all because of this grading fiasco, okay? Let's um, move on to our panel discussion about this, okay? Okay, so I'm going to start with you, um, Dr. Michael. Um, so if a parent recognises that their child might be struggling with learning, what are some of the signs and symptoms that a parent should be looking out for to detect whether their child may have um, some kind of learning difficulty? Yeah, he hello everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, your, your, ca your camera's off though. Yeah, I tried to put it on. It says that You've stopped it. It says the host oh. stopped it. I'm Maybe not sure if Nigel might be able to help. Or... Yeah, okay. I think it's going to start now. Okay. Good. Okay. Hi, everyone. Yes, yeah, a very broad question, isn't it? I've really enjoyed so far what everyone's been saying. Um, I understand the audience is mainly parents and young people between the age of 10 to 14. Is that right? If people just type in the chat, who are you? Are you a parent? Are you a teacher? Are you a student? Um, yeah, if you just type in the chat and that will give us a bit of an idea. Yeah, so I think there's, there's not a, a final answer. It's a very broad question, but what, what kind of comes to mind is, um, first of all, just to kind of give a bit of background to my thinking. So we know that if you're from a black background or an underprivileged background, generally in primary school, particularly for black children, your academic achievement is above average or average compared to other groups. But when they move to secondary school, there are lots of things which either there are barriers or things can go wrong. Um, so there's not necessarily specific symptoms of someone struggling with their learning, but it's about looking at how much time does the family have, the parent have, the child have, and the space to explore that with the school. Um, so the relationship with the school is very, very important. So I, I tend to see young people right at the end of when they're maybe presenting with something like ADHD or a severe behavioral problem or autism. But when you actually track it back, you start to see there's been a breakdown often between the school, teachers, the parents and the child. And I think some of the things I often recommend is actually the parents having a school meeting quite early on with the teacher to understand and to tr even track back to primary school. So are they a child who was performing at an average level? Were they always below average? Or were they actually above average? And if they're in year seven or year eight and then there's suddenly a, a decline, then that is much more significant than if they were always tracking lower than, than average. And often that is the case. They're suddenly underperforming maybe in maths or certain specific subjects. Um, and actually the presumption can be that they've always struggled with maths when actually when you track it back, they were okay. They were average or above average in primary school. And I think that's some of the parents role as well to kind of give that information to the school and to recognize that. And also to obviously speak with, the young person and kind of get their perspective on what their expectations are. Do they think that this is what they're capable of? And sometimes that may be the parent, that may be the teacher talking to them, that could be someone else within the family. And then it's really pulling together. So I think it was Elaine Cunningham that was talking about some of the role of the family and the parents as well. But of course, if we're talking about disadvantaged backgrounds, there's often, there's not enough time or enough space often to 
go there to that level of detail because it, it does take a lot more effort than if the child is performing consistently well and has no difficulties. And it, it can happen at any time. So it could, could be fine one day and then the next school term, there could be a, a sharp decline and the parent really has to be in tune with picking that up. And if you're from a disadvantaged background, that's often much harder. If you've got maybe the stereotype, I mean, I came from a single parent background. Obviously I'm black Caribbean um, and I managed to buck the trend, but my mum was very much almost paranoid of, of those sorts of situations, which in the end helped me. Um, so there was, she was always kind of checking in and there was definitely significant declines and I focused a bit too much on girls or sports or all the normal teenage things. There was a need for the teachers to recognize that and my parents and myself and actually to address it early. Um, so I can see if you're from a disadvantaged background time and time again, it's much harder to identify early people who have a bit more time, a bit more space, maybe working from home like we've discussed the COVID pandemic, a lot of people in higher income um, families, they're able to work from home and they have a highly skilled profession so that they're much more able to oversee and provide the equipment um, and to continue the learning. Whereas if you're from a lower socioeconomic background, you might be sharing devices. The parents might be doing jobs which require them to go outside, not in the home. And like your, your statistics said, you know, there's a significant reduction in time spent studying seven days in the end during the whole period. Um, but in my, I have to say I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist, so I deal with people who also have severe learning disability. So that's learning disability where their IQ is far below the average. Whereas I think your question, most people when they think of learning difficulties, they're talking about within the average, but they might have a specific learning problem like dyslexia, you know, struggling to follow letters or numbers or they might have a specific issue around um, num like mathematics so we call it dyscalculia or it could be literally other factors so as i've said like the social factors there's a lot of stereotypes there's a lot of things where black boys in particular are positioned in a particular way around puberty um, which it's easier actually to go along with those stereotypes it's particularly if you're one of a few people in that school who are black um, which was my experience. I went to schools primarily where I was one or two or three black people. Um, and so it was quite easy to fall into a sporty stereotype or a rude boy stereotype. When actually you need people around you, teachers not to look at you in an unbiased way. You need your parents also to be on top of that. And also yourself, you need to have knowledge of, of people around you like role models um, that you can identify with. So the question is quite broad. Um, so, can I, so can, I just, uh, can I ask you then, for um, what are the services that parents should be aware of to access? How, how do people get access to help if they think they, their child may need extra help or need some kind of diagnosis or assessment? Yeah, so if you think that you're, say you had a school meeting with, your, with the teachers and they've, they've recognised that the child is underperforming, and it's maybe specific to mathematics, for example, and they're really struggling, they're losing their confidence, then in an ideal world, you would want that school, the first place to look is at the school and your own home resources. So if the school can provide anything extra, often that's not the case, particularly if you're in an underprivileged background or in a school which is struggling themselves, but that is the first port of call. So there are some schools, when I speak to parents, there are actually after school or before school clubs to increase um, the time to learn, also online um, resources. But again, you're requiring the motivation of the child and possibly some boundaries in place by the parents. And if there are external pressures, that can be more difficult. A lot of people end up resorting to tutors. So I was one of those people. My mum invested, maybe sacrificed something else in order to give me a chemistry tutor and a maths tutor because I wasn't going to be able to do it just by looking online or having my regular teacher who's not specifically trying to boost my grade. He's just maybe doing the enough to get by. Whereas actually sometimes you need specific tutors to really identify your weaknesses and that can actually turn things around quite quickly. So it might seem like you might look at the hourly rate and think, oh, that's too much money, but actually you may not need to do that forever. You may need to do that for one term in order to 
almost change the, the momentum. And then schools should have an educational psychologist, but again, they're in very short supply and it's really for the severe end of the scale. So if you suspect your child might have something like ADHD, so attention deficit, then the school may agree to have an educational psychologist um, do an assessment on them and it will look at some kind of numbers around their learning, their English, their maths, and then they may then recommend further assessment. If you felt that you wanted to go down the health route and see someone like myself, there's a long kind of process through the Children's Mental Health Service where you can self-refer often as parents. That's kind of a newish initiative where parents can self-refer. You can ask your GP to refer, but that's only really for specific conditions such as ADHD, autism. And if you felt that your child was, had a learning disability, so we're talking an IQ below 70. So that's someone that would maybe need to go to a special school rather than a, a mainstream school. Um, but I think you have to look at the school, the teachers first, what resources are available. The teachers should also have the best access to advise you if you wanted to go somewhere else. And then you may have to prepare yourself for investing in a tutor. And it may be a short term measure just to address things that they're missing. And then the educational psychology route um, is usually where people go next. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. It's really, really helpful and useful. And I can see there's a lot of chat, um, a lot of discussion going on in the chat as well. Um, I'd like to turn to William now. Um, William, so you you talked to we we know that you did really well in your GCSEs. You're doing some really complex subjects now in your A levels. Um, from a student's perspective, we want to find out how have you found studying during the COVID nineteen lockdown period. So what was it like for you? What were some of the challenges? Um, how did you manage your time? If you just give us, um, yeah, just, just your brief answer of how you found that period and how you were able to manage your time. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I am now going to be a year 13 student starting September. And originally for lockdown, I found it good that I had like my own space to do my own work because it meant that I could allocate time to specific areas which I needed to improve on and I could even pick up new skills um, for instance me I, I decided to pick up further maths during the lockdown period um, which I wasn't doing at the start of the year but I did along along the way I did notice that sometimes you you really miss that um the advice and the guidance of a teacher um because it's more more so with my history studies uh there are certain uh concepts which i needed explaining or certain ideas i really wanted to go through which maybe yeah they might give me advice through microsoft teams but there's only so much you can do and when you have that physical contact that's when you really see the feedback really starting to have an, have an impact. Um, there were obviously times of um, lack of motivation because that's where your mental health is very important because when you're constantly waking up, doing work in your room, same day, next day, repeat cycle, it's a cycle, ongoing cycle, um, it really starts to take a toll on you because you're not seeing your friends, for instance, at school, um, you're not really going outside. So for that, I would say, make sure you always take care of your mental health because that's the priority. Um, nothing goes above that. Um, and maybe go outside for a walk, um, you know, talk to your friends, organize um, different meetings with your friends perhaps. But um, towards the end, when I started to remember my goals and started to realize what I want to work for that's when the motivation was coming so I would say even just write your write your goals down on paper constantly remind yourself of that and maybe have someone to hold you accountable um, and also um, keep, um, take care of your mental health Thank you so much, William. That's really insightful. And I hope for the students in the room that they could relate to that, that they could also draw some um, pearls of wisdom from what William was able to share. Um, 
And, you know, we know that during this period of lockdown, there's not just been a, a, a virus and a global pandemic, but there's also been many other things happening in our world that have had a massive impact. And I would like to kind of go to you, Tyrone, and look at and explore what impact do we think with, you know, students witnessing murders happening um, through just watching the video on their phones and seeing you know thousands of people um, going on a march and having a massive uh, you know a massive drive to raise awareness of racism inequality and racially um, driven killings what impact do we think that is having on young people whether they're from disadvantaged backgrounds or not whether they're um, black minority and ethnic um, backgrounds or not what impact do we think this is having on students I think, um, yeah, as I alluded to earlier on, I think 2020 has been a massive eye-opener for many of us. Um, and the truth of the matter is our young people are just that. They are young people. And whereas they are already trying to navigate and process their way through the world, they're being hit with COVID uh, and having to stay inside and doing everything completely differently. And then also the, the onslaught of... Uh, imagery and discussion and everything else that might make them a little bit more aware of their black bodies. Um, the way how I like to see it and process it is the fact that most black people will have uh, an awakening when they get to a point of what I would call racial puberty, which is that every single one of us comes to a point where we realize our black bodies. Um, where we realize that not only are we not only are we different, but we realize that the world that we live in actually isn't always in our favor. Oftentimes it's not. And even though you might be one of those people that can buck the trend, and even though you might be one of those success stories, and that's phenomenal, statistically, the majority are not and do not have those those uh, those exposures, those experiences. Um, and everything else and, and uh, often there are big cases just like George Floyd that I think that most of us have to experience and go through. I know for me personally mine was uh, Stephen Lawrence. Growing up Stephen Lawrence was the big racial case. Uh, being born in the 80s and being brought up in the 90s. Stephen Lawrence was, was monumental. I remember my nephew, uh, his one, he, he's, he's 20 now and his one in particular was Trayvon Martin and everything that happened then. And now with my younger, my, youngest nephew, my younger nephew, his one was now George Floyd. And seeing them have to process what is going on is very difficult and very challenging. Uh, I spoke to countless people uh, during the process of what was happening and everybody that I knew that was black more or less was struggling. So if we as adults are struggling, more so the young people are gonna be struggling and navigating it. Uh, not only, this is the thing that I found about, about everything that happened this year, was that people were sad about George Floyd. We were, we were deeply moved about George Floyd. But what it did uh, universally is it awakened uh, the experiences that every single one of us has had, whether that's, you know, somebody crossing the street when you're walking down the street, whether it's, uh, you know, being stopped and having to go into a bar or whatever, two by two, whether it's the inappropriate comments that you know that your colleagues make, whether it's the stuff that your teachers said, whether it's being stopped and searched or pulled over in the car, whatever it is, all those collective experiences have gone, had come to people where they said, this is not okay and enough is enough and I'm very tired and people have been tired. They've been tired. It's not something that's particularly new. And for our young people to navigate what was happening with COVID and then have to navigate, well, hold on, who am I in this society? Because no longer is it okay for us to think, oh, this is a US problem and this is, an Amer uh, this is a UK problem. Actually, statistically, the same disparities still exist in either societies. And so not only did they see the rise in the upsurgence of people uh, taken to protests and people talking about it and everything else, they also have to deal with the reality of a society that challenges that very boldly 
with the anti-protest to basically say, shut up, sit down, know your place. And we're not having any of that disruption there. Be happy with what you've got. Oh, this is an American problem. I don't know why you're making such a big deal about it. So here you've got a young person already navigating and trying to make sense of themselves and make sense of themselves in the world. And often this may potentially have been a big point for so many of our young people that are already dealing with anxieties and issues and processing and navigating their, uh, their, their experiences and racialized experiences. And the most difficult thing to do, because I know that a lot of parents I can see in here, is how do you navigate them through that? Most people and most parents in here would have already sat down and had the conversation of some sort, you know, the conversation with their child, whether it be about the protection of their black bodies, the way how they are perceived, whether they're aggressive or threatening, whether they have to code switch or change your tone or have your tone policed. All of those things, I think, are the myriad of it. And the difficulty is knowing that as a parent, as a guardian, as a leader, that you cannot take that pain away from that young person. But they have to sit with it and experience it in the way that they make sense of it. And you have to guide them through that in the best way that you know possible. Uh, so our young people, I think, are deeply affected. Even if they aren't able to articulate it, please understand that this experience has gone in their memory bank, that at some point when they are older, they will look back on it and go, oh, this was another point where I experienced racial inequalities and it really challenged me to the core about who I am and my existence in this world. Wow, 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 thank you, thank you. Um, and just, can you just add, how can, how do you think going back to school in September, schools should be prepared to deal with that, even if, the students might not be able to articulate it, being aware that there is an undercurrent, there is um, an iceberg beneath the surface, you know, um, what would you suggest to teachers who are aware that this is going on but don't know how to deal with it or haven't received the training? What would you suggest or what would you recommend? It's time to hold people to account. We know and have known for a very long time that the education system, along with many other institutions in our country, are institutionalized races. We know that. Um, we've known it for a while. It's been documented for a while. But how much are we holding places to account? Because often we think about them on an individualized situation. So it's this teacher in particular is racist, or that uh, scenario or situation in particular was racist. But actually, in fact, it's the systematic, it's the policy level worth of discrimination and biases and, and, and institutionalized racism that allow these things to happen in the first place. And that's why I'm saying it's no longer enough for particular individuals and even institutions themselves to not be racist. It's no longer enough to say, but I'm not racist because. The challenge now becomes, but are you anti-racist? Because you've seen everything that's gone on in the world and you've seen everything that's happening. And now you can no longer live in the privilege of, of ignorance to sit there and say, oh, I wasn't aware. I mean, if you're not aware, that's a bigger, that's a bigger issue. But everybody, I think, more or less should be aware. So we hold people to account and we hold schools to account. Uh, educators, we hold the leadership to account and we work long term and it has to be long term to make sure that the environments and the spaces that we are creating for our young people are safe and it allows them to flourish. It allows their black souls to express themselves in a way that isn't deemed threatening, isn't deemed uh, uh, less than, isn't deemed subnormal, isn't deemed uh, uh, worthy of interrogation, but rather worthy of acceptance and worthy of love and worthy of purpose. That's the difference. Our black bodies no longer need to be controlled, but they need to be afforded the same respect of inspiration and protection and resources and everything else that we know our counterparts do. It's time to ask your leadership or your child's school, uh, what anti-racist policies are you putting in place? I don't want a statement. I don't need a video. I don't, want, I don't want a tagline. 
and please do not, you know, uh, uh, signpost me somewhere else. What I want to know is I understand it's a massive global national problem we need to fix, but within your area of influence, in your sphere, in your space, please explain to me what you were doing to make sure that my child is safe. Uh, and safe in, in and, and it is, it's a core of safeguarding, but make sure my, my child is safe in, in, in their ability to develop. Thank you. Thank you, Tyrone. Emma, Emma, can I just add to what Tyrone yeah. so and I was applauding because you are just saying everything that I have been speaking to schools. Can you believe that some schools are more comfortable about talking about the safety of COVID-19 than they are talking about race relations in their school? And when I ask a school, what does your especially in private schools, what does your, your governing body look like? Was your, the, the, the response I got from some schools was, I don't understand the question you're asking me. Well, okay, if you want me to be clear, are they just white middle-aged because they don't understand where I'm coming from? And who is writing your race relations policy? It cannot be a white person. You know, I went to a GPDST school and they have a steering committee. And my question to them was, who is chairing that committee? Because it can't be a white girl that I went to school with because she doesn't understand the struggles that I went through or that my my lower counterpart sisters are going through who are a lower age but I think you're very right in that every school must be held accountable in having a race relations policy because you know what listen to this if a child is caught smoking in school there is a procedure that they follow to deal with that child but if a child is told that they feel that they're being uh, ridiculed because of the color of the skin my own son was stabbed in the chest with a fork in a private prep school and it was because of the color of his skin. Now he was questioned, taken through a certain series of things and made to think that what he was going through was something in his mind. If somebody else was doing that in terms of bullying or any, there is a specific procedure that you follow, but when it's race related, it's, it's something that we're imagining, it's something that we're thinking. So I totally agree with you. And it's something that I'm looking to champion um, looking to champion that I think that every school, whether you're private, whether you're state, whether you're an academy, you need to have, it's, you cannot be a tick box exercise. And I think I wrote an article recently that said that, you know, we can't have a tick box article, exactly what you said, don't sign my post me to somewhere else. Don't say this and don't say that. What exactly is your policy? If somebody comes with this problem, how do you deal with it as a school? And don't shy away from it. And also the other thing is when you have inset days for schools, there are inset days that teach you about understanding sexuality and understanding how people can be different in terms of who they are, whether they're homosexual, bisexual, whatever. But there's nothing that teaches teachers how to understand what it is to be black or an ethnic minority. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Elaine. Thank you so much. Shakira, was you about to say something? Yes, I'm so sorry. Uh, just very, very briefly. Um, so the challenge that I face in my school is that, um, you know, kind of many students come in lacking, uh, I mean, the vocabulary to even help them to, to, to fully, fully access all their subjects anyway. Um, but that then impedes on their ability to express their emotions and you know a lot of young people who I've come into contact with um, I adore my students so much they um, they find it really really difficult I don't know what the term is but they find it difficult to almost express and understand that they feel two different emotions at the same time or even more than that and so you know sometimes this can just come out as anger um, and it they have every right to be you know I yeah they have every right to be um but sometimes it's so easy for people to see that especially um especially you know kind of a black child and just say well you know anger's not going to solve it but actually that doesn't help the child to process what he or she is going through and i think that it's really important you know i mean i'm hoping you know i'm um i mentioned this before you know i'm half caribbean i'm half i'm half asian so you know, I I know my history um, and I know where you come from. And so I may not look like I'm Black Caribbean, but I feel it. And although I hope that my school, when you go back, will have something in their inset, I'm preparing myself. Uh, one way that I'm preparing myself is just by, I'm, I'm planning in time and space 
for them to to process and some of that will be within their writing some of that will be within their reading um, in conversation sometimes actually just uh not telling them how they feel but sometimes just asking so you know um you know let's say the young person it you know kind of expresses their views of about the murders that they've seen and it's horrible that a child should see that on their phone um you know one might ask or one might, yeah, uh, one might ask that child, you know, it sounds like you're feeling, you know, quite distressed about this. Um, like, do you want to talk? And then just let them speak. Like, just let them be heard. Because for so many of these young people, they're not. Um, and it's so important that they feel, that, that we, we, we listen to hear and that we don't try to provide them with the solutions. Help them to figure out what's going on because we are struggling to figure out what's going on. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna stop there, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is such a rich and powerful discussion. Thank you, um, Tyrone, Elaine, Shakira, for just um, really giving us so much insight there um, and being so transparent. Tyrone, do you have something you want yeah, to share? Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing onto that, just based on what Shakira is saying. It's so important that we do uh, uh, allow spaces for our young people to express. It's incredibly important. Again, like I said, therein lies their soul, therein lies their experiences, and that's what we don't want to kill. If you kill the soul, the body is so much more easily uh, disregarded. Um, but it's so important that we give them spaces to talk. Um, the problem is with racism in this country is that sometimes it is so difficult to articulate. And often you might even hear young people refer to a behavior that a teacher has done or so on and so forth and be like, that teacher's racist or that was racist. Instantly, that white fragility in the teacher backs up and they're like, I'm not racist, you know what? And they're deeply offended. Call me anything else, but don't call me racist. So they're deeply offended by that. But, and it's also getting people to understand that actually it's not about you. It's not about that one particular incident. And yes, that one particular incident may have been innocent in what you were choosing to do. You have to accept and appreciate for that young person, they associated that with their history of racism that says, okay, well, I feel like I'm being disadvantaged in this, in this scenario, because it's not that one thing. It's the different looks, it's the nuances, it's the microaggressions, it's the, all of those experiences that already as a young person has come into contact with or, or had experiences with, that they have to live in a world where they know they're different. And so every time when something comes up and they, see it or they feel it and they call it out let's listen to that let's navigate them through that rather than just uh disregard it or or even tell them off for it like th th this is a part of their experience and i think that that's something that we definitely need to do i think you're still on mute by the way Thank you. I think Andrea wanted to raise a point, but um, if we can keep the rest of the points brief, I, I please, I want to speak to Paula and then I really want to spend some time talking to Jordan. Sure. Um, I think what I wanted to say is I think it's really important um, to remember that the black experience is not homogenous. There is no sort of correct way to be black. There is no, this is what all black people feel. And I think that's really important. Having said that, it's really awkward to say, but we need the right types of black people in these spaces. Um, there are some people that hold very problematic ideas and ideals that we don't want our young people going to. We don't want our young people going to somebody who's going to say, oh, I feel like this has happened as a result of my skin color for a fellow black person to turn around and say, oh, you know, it's not, don't make it all about race and all of those kind of um, very stereotypical comments. And I think all the things that we've spoken about, the importance of representation, all of these things are important because actually, if you're living in an inner city school, you're more likely to have a black teacher. But if you're not, and we're talking about these Russell Group universities and all these things, when people don't have somebody to speak to, 
what do they do? And I think as a black academic myself, I am deeply inspired by the looks on faces of black kids when they walk into the lecture hall. And you know, we always have to go through that first sort of awkward five minutes of, oh, you know, so like, you know, are you the cleaner or are you here to set up? And I'm like, no, I'm here to, I'm your lecturer. And from black um, young people and from non-black young people alike, and I think the spark that I see in black, um, they're not really kids, are they, when they go to universities, adults, when they walk into that room, but some of them have never had a black teacher before. Some of them haven't been told that a black person can be a lecturer or can be an academic um, or somebody that they can relate to, um, somebody that is from, from South London and doesn't fit into this sort of other type of black person category that we have. Um, and that's kind of what I wanted to say, really. Thank you. Um, I want to um, put, um, draw on some of Paula's experiences. So Paula, um, you wrote a book about black British history and a lot of what's been discussed here is talk, it, it relates to the impact on one's identity and how um, students, with, we're focusing at the moment on black students, but how students um, view themselves. But I don't think it's just black students, students from all, I mean, if you're seeing inequalities um, happening at a disproportionate rate, for example, to black peers, then your identity and your viewpoint of black people or yourself or hierarchies in, in, in the world will be shaped by that. And Paula, you've written a book about black British history. Um, you're teaching Key Stage 3 students. Can you tell us a bit about the impact of understanding history and, and something that's not readily taught in our schools currently in our curriculum, what impact does this have on young people's identity and how they view themselves or what do you think it can have and what are your hopes of your book? And Nigel, if you can show the slide um, with Paula's book, please. Great. Do I talk now, Emma? Okay, greetings, um, everyone. Um, thank you for everyone's contribution so far. It's been very, very um, knowledgeable. Um, so we've written Black British history for the reason of some of the discussions in here. It was about representation um, with young black students. So we've written the book in line with the national curriculum as well. So the book is a textbook, it has 32 lessons in there. Um, and it was a book that shows representation of black people being successful in other areas apart from sports and music. So you have black people, black intellectuals, you have black um, scientists, you have black people in the arts, black people in politics. So it's about a, having representation that young black people can have as when they have aspirations they have people to refer to that look like them that are in those roles so for an example um there was a there's a Ghanaian surgeon that pioneered the keyhole surgery um, and in 2005 he was the president of the royal college of surgeons now that's really important for a young child or a young young person who wants to go into the medical field knowing that there are people that look like him that have had really prominent positions um so teaching it is really really good but really really inspiring because when you are giving this information to young people and you see them light up like oh wow i didn't know that it's an amazing thing um and also we wrote it that a lot of adults are unaware of this information as well. So when you're learning it, you're able to learn alongside your child and, and have conversations as well. So the book um, is done in textbook style. It has text, sources to back up what we're saying and activity questions. So we wrote it this way. So in schools normally, what I learned, what my children learned, what my parents learned, probably what grandparents learned is the same thing in school. So whether it's, slavery or American civil rights. There is so a vast amount of um, rich black British history for us to have in the schools. And also it's about having black history, not just in the history class, it can be in English, it can be in all disciplines in every, um, every discipline within the school as well. So my aspirations as well, although it's black British history to raise aspirations and to have representation for young black children, it's also a way of breaking negative stereotypes for 
non-black people. So when um, white children or, or, or Asian children, or any of a, a race of children are learning this information as well, they're able, Johnny's able to go back to granddad and say, granddad, did you know that there's, that it was a black surgeon that pioneered the keyhole surgery? Or did you know that although I knew it was Rosa Parks that had the bus boycott in, in, in America, there was actually a bus boycott in Britain as well in 1963. Did you know that, Granddad? So it's about um, raising aspirations and also breaking negative stereotypes because some young children come from um, homes where there's a negative stereotype around black people. And if they're in their school environment learning about the positive contributions that black people have made in this country alone, um, it, it has a spiral effect. It has a domino effect as well. Thank you so much, Paula, for sharing that. I think that's a valuable addition to our discussion. And I think we also have to be mindful that this is something as a parent, if you're a parent here, um, go out and, and get these resources to use at home rather than waiting for a school to change or the government to change the, the curriculum, get the resources and be, take ownership for um, being the one who helps to form the, uh, the, the mindset and the identity that your child carries forward in, in their future. So um, I would like to talk to Jordan. Jordan is one of our younger panelists and we're going to run, have to run over into session two, um, session three, because we definitely need to hear from this young man. Um, Jordan, are you there? I'm there, can you hear me? Okay, yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. We talked the other day about mindset. I mean, let me just, um, just, we need to celebrate our young people. And particularly when they are doing well, we need to celebrate them. So I hope that you guys in the comments will give some really positive messages to Jordan and William, um, um, who are the youngest panelists here, and for what they're doing, and even stepping out in a platform of 99 people here, they are speaking on that platform. Jordan, you um, did your BTEC in business studies. Yeah. And can you explain to people why you chose a BTEC? What is a BTEC? Um, and you know, what your grade, you got a distinction, what and we, yeah. you described that's equivalent to three A's. Why did you choose your BTEC? And how did you position yourself and keep yourself disciplined to achieve the grades that you did? Yeah, so firstly, the reason I decided to do a BTEC is because it involved a lot more coursework and practical work and rather than just exams. And because of this, it allowed me to develop like key employment skills, which I found was very important. And basically, um, that would tell me, it would basically help with the career path I wanted to get into. Um, and what's the second question, sorry? So I wanted to find out from you, what we talked about your mindset. You, you yeah. told me about your routine. Can you share with the audience and the other students that are here, how you were able to structure your day during the lockdown period when you still had to submit pieces of work? What did your day look like? And how did you, you talked about the mindset you had, the books that you're reading. Can you share some of that with us, please? Yeah, so firstly, when to yeah so firstly with mindset the first thing i found was setting goals is very important to achieve my um grade in the beta i found that when i was setting my goals it allowed me to stay a lot more focused and have a sense of direction when i wanted to achieve my goals um also because i had a strong reason why i attached to the goal i wanted to achieve it allowed me to stay a lot more consistent when i wanted to um achieve allow me to stay a lot more consistent and basically just like overcome any kind of obstacles that I wanted to, um, any kind of obstacles, yeah, basically. Um, yeah, that was pretty much it for the mindset. Um, yeah. So, so how did you avoid distractions? Obviously you got social media, you got your phone, you got friends. Um, how was you able to, um, you, you mentioned you had your goals, um, what was it about your goals that helped you to not procrastinate, not, not spend, you know, an copious amounts of time just on your phone or speaking to your friends every day? Yeah, so definitely just having the right structure. I mean, every single day, you know, I'd wake up early and just basically just plan out my day first and then ensure that um, I was able to know what I had to get done. So I'd wake up early, get my work done, 
kind of have like a cut off day as cut off time as well for like when I needed to like stop and have a rest and basically just make sure I was like spending the right amount of time on everything I needed to do and yeah so even like just with coursework and everything like that I'd make sure that um I set a goal for every um, I'd make sure that I set a goal for um how much I'm going to get done for each day and then yeah essentially I just was able to get as much done as possible over a longer period of time okay amazing and i know when we spoke you said that you got b's and c's in your gcse's um yeah. but the trajectory that you're on now is, is is you've gone to another gear what changed and for those parents who want to know what they or those teachers who want to know what they can do to kind of flip the switch in the young people that are in their lives what changed for you how did it change what were the things that you did to to, to switch gears yeah, so the main way I was able to like make that transition from GCSEs to sixth form was basically just from being a lot more organised in my work and planning ahead. I thought that when you plan ahead of your work, you know, you kind of have, a, again, a better sense of direction for what you need to get done. And it just allowed me to not really like waste time either. And I think it's a good discipline to have as well, just organising your time properly and being able to focus, yeah. Amazing, amazing. Um, Tell us a bit about where you see yourself in the next three to five years and how did that impact what you're, you know, the decisions you've made so far? Yeah, so in the next three to five years, I see myself working in either a finance industry or the IT industry. And um, do it. But basically, the reason I want to enter these industries is because obviously there's loads of opportunities for like career growth and development. And I thought that with these um, industries I'm interested in, there's quite a high demand as well. Um, and yeah, just because of those industries alone, I just feel like I'll be able to develop a lot and basically just um, improve. Okay, so I've got two last questions for you, Jordan. Um, the first question is, um, you've obviously, it sounds like you've put a lot of work into researching about different careers, demand in those careers. Where would you point other students to it if they, if you, you know, you're encouraging them to look into the best careers to go into um, based on their interests or based on their talents. Where did, you, where did you look when you were researching about careers and the data surrounding those careers to inform your decisions? Yeah, well, firstly, for me, I started to talk to quite a lot of family members, like anyone that's close to me or anyone who I've seen who I kind of respect and like, I see what they're, doing, what they're doing with their life and I see what, um, if I see someone doing good, I'd always like, ask them well what do you do how do you do that sort of thing and basically just talking to a bunch of people and kind of getting the insight to um how they kind of operate and stuff and because um i was able to talk to a lot of people it kind of sparked my interest and allowed me to figure out what i wanted to do basically but then again yeah researching um careers that are in demand is quite it's quite popular as well i'm important as well yeah and was there any specific websites you went to or was it more um you spoke to people and they pointed you in a certain direction? Yeah, it was mainly just me talking to people and them kind of pointing me in a certain direction for um, the good careers that I could choose, basically. But, brilliant, yeah. brilliant. And so you, you even, you know, you, you've done a BTEC, but you're still very academic. But what advice would you give to a student who feels like, I've done my GCSEs and I don't feel very academic? Like, what advice would you give to them? Yeah, the best advice, I'd probably give to someone is to learn a trade. I feel like when you have a trade that always provides a solid foundation for you and allows you to always be able to, you know, provide for yourself or just have something to do basically where you can create a good income or whatever. So for example, even um, engineering or plumbing, those are like two really important trades mm -hmm. that I've um, looked into. And I've even seen some of my friends, they've gone onto that, um, those trades now. And after about two years, they'll be able to be on like good salaries. So that's always like an alternative route as well. So it's not always the academic route that you have to go down if it's not necessarily um, the best suited to you. Yeah. And I mean, I, I love speaking to you, Jordan, because there's so many pot. I think the first time I spoke to Jordan, I felt like I had to go and lie down because the <laughs> amount of wisdom I received from this young man, I was blown away. And I just want to ask you a question about your opinion on university, because obviously you're going through or you want to go through the apprenticeship route. But yeah. from, you know, you, you've kind of weighed up 
university versus apprenticeship and you even describing to me not to go into too much detail on that but describing that actually sometimes you can go to university and the jobs are wanting you to have experience that you don't get in university and then you're struggling yeah. you've got a degree and you can't can you just elaborate on that a little bit yeah so to your decision yeah so for me it, 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 um kind of varies for everyone but what i would say is is that um if you know what you want to do definitely research into it and kind of see if there's like alternative career options because what i find with a lot of my older friends is who's finished uni now is that like they're struggling to get jobs and they've done all that work for three years so even if like you kind of see alternatives so if you research and you see oh this career that i'm interested in there's a career path through doing the apprenticeship always try to go down that route because that way you're building the experience which is what the employers want and then that way, so um, basically, it's a better route for you to get to your career, and you're still earning on the side as well, which I think is quite important for everyone. Amazing, amazing, and and um, thank you so much, Jordan. Um, Elaine, on that point that Jordan made about finding alternative routes, can you just touch on that about alternative routes, and then we'll go to. We'll see about the comments we've received and, and Q&A, but Elaine, if you're there, can you just touch on looking at alternatives? If you don't get, you know, we didn't get to touch about the A-level fiasco and everything. We, we didn't, we, we can't touch on that, unfortunately, based on time. But mm -hmm. if somebody, um, you know, didn't get the university choice that they wanted or the grades that they wanted, what are your thoughts on, what would you be your advice, Elaine? Um, well, there are there are two things. Um, I think Jordan touched on um, the apprenticeship route and um, one of the things that I, I, I want to address quickly is that BTEC doesn't necessarily mean that you're not academic, it just means that you process things in a different way because there are people that I know that have done BTECs and have gone to Durham University to do their first degree. So we need to understand what BTECs actually stand for and what it is exactly you're trying to achieve. So when we talk about apprenticeships, our old way of thinking about apprenticeships is it's Joe Bloggs down the road who's doing a mechanic uh, apprenticeship or something like that. but um, the big five are doing apprenticeships. So you've got PwC, Ernest & Young, um, some of investment banks are doing apprenticeship. You just need to understand, and I'll go back to what I said initially, people perish for lack of knowledge. A lot of people just assume that if I'm going to do an apprenticeship, um, I'm going to do it this way. I'm not really sure which avenue Jordan took, but I think it's important that we, we de-stereotype the word apprenticeship to think that this is the route for a certain type of student and this is the route. There are very, very, very affluent people doing BTECs and getting into, I have a group of people that I know that did food technology for A-level and they're reading cybersecurity at Oxford. I'm sorry, it's about strategy, okay? That's number one. Number two, um, I think, you have to just decide what it is you want to achieve. Like I always say, there is more than one way to skin a cat. Um, and so if you want to become a doctor, there is nothing written in stone. We understand that the traditional way is that I do three sciences at A-level and I apply to medical school. There are other ways to become a doctor. Um, and I always say to parents who come to me, well, why do you want your child to be a doctor of medicine? You can be like Andrea and hold a, have a PhD. You still have DR at the beginning of your name. What's your problem? You know, so we need to demystify a lot of these belief systems that we have. Um, what was the other question you asked me? You asked me about... For those students who feel like the world has ended because, you know, um, they, with the, for example, with the grading, um, A-level grading fiasco, they, the grades, were, some of the grades were downgraded and so mm -hmm. other, um, other students were able to get certain places in the university of their choice, um, they weren't able to get. And so what advice would you give them? Okay, so the advice that I would give, because I obviously during a levels i had a lot of parents phoning me and my thing is that you always go for the price whatever it is you want to achieve you go for it so for example um the children that were downgraded i had some parents call me and i said so what are you doing to talk about this and the irony is i didn't have any private school kids that were phoning me it was all state school children that were phoning me to say they've been downgraded because the private school were on the phone to the university saying um, this is a child that they were arguing and they were being advocates for these children. So in that position where you're not in that 
that kind of position to do that as a parent as somebody who wants to go to a particular university you need to be on the phone be screaming be pleading your case but also even if you didn't get the grade another strategy is that you didn't get the grade i had a client that didn't get into warwick university to do law okay so you didn't get into Warwick university to do law but maybe you can still get into warwick doing criminology you're still at warwick university at the end of the day when you finish your course nobody's going to ask you what you studied they're going to ask you what university you went to at the end of the day so it's all about strategy and if you didn't get the grades that you wanted it's okay it's not that big a deal I went into university and did dentistry. I didn't get the grades I wanted first. Nobody knows that because that was how many moons ago? Nobody knows that. But the, the thing is, you have to ask yourself when these things happen, what are you learning from it? What lessons am I learning from this? And move on it and, and, and use that as your sounding point. That You know what? Somebody sent me something recently on WhatsApp and it was this time you're not starting from scratch. You're starting from experience. And I believe that these kind of processes, these kind of experiences teach us certain lessons and we know not to do them again. Jordan has learned at an early age about goal setting. There are some women I know in their 50s who don't know and understand about goal setting. So, yeah, that's my advice. Thank you, Elaine. And I see Andrew's got a hand up. And um, Andrea, yeah. Sorry, I forgot to press on mute. Um, yeah, I think... Um, Understanding the system, as um, Elaine just so beautifully and eloquently said, is so important. Um, not getting into the university of choice, not getting the grades, you can apply through clearing. There's so many pathways or ways to get back on the path that you want to go on. Um, and I think people don't understand, as Elaine said, the power of making phone calls. Um, universities are private institutions. Universities want to make money. That's what it ultimately comes down to. Um, there are caps on how much universities can charge currently. Um, there's discussions around changing that. Um, but as Tamara pointed out, it, yes, it will cost you the same amount of money that it will cost you to go to Cambridge than it would to go to the university down the road from you. But there are other stipulations. As she pointed out, you can't work if you're studying at um, Cambridge University, whereas you can work if you're studying somewhere else. And I think considering your entire life plan, considering the entire picture, are you um, going to be, de um, depending on financial aid, are you going to be able to afford to live in halls? What are you doing? How are you, communi how are you commuting? All of these things are things to consider and have conversations with people and build almost like a community of practice with other people where you can say, actually, what are the alternative routes for me to get to where I want to get to? If you want to do a master's in something, a lot of people don't realize you don't have to do an undergraduate in the same thing that you want to do a master's in. So if you can't get into that thing, that you, particular thing that you want to do, can you do something else to allow you to have the credits? Because that's what university is about ultimately. It's about having the credits to progress. Can you do something else that will allow you to have the 360 credits that you need to do a master's? It doesn't really matter about you ha have to do this particular type of degree. Um, and also I think one of the big things that we, especially maybe in the black community, do is we want to follow this track through after college you have to go to university you don't have to go to university at 18. i am actually a massive advocate for not going to university at 18. i went to university at 18 um to do a nursing degree um you know from an african household you didn't you have all of the, those those boxes that you have to do i didn't enjoy it i dropped out i was disowned by family members for that particularly, and I went back to university when I was 25, I think, yeah. And I genuinely enjoyed my university experience when I went at 25, I had knowledge, I had um, work experience, I knew what I was doing, I knew exactly where I wanted to go. And I think it's really important that we don't put that pressure on 18 year olds to make a life changing decision that this is what you're going to study and this is where your life trajectory is going to go. We need to encourage our young people to, to do things that have a gap year. If your black child comes to you and says, mom, I want to go um, traveling for a year, don't be thinking, oh, but, you know, auntie so-and-so's son is going to university. It doesn't matter what auntie so-and-so's son is doing. Let your child do those things. Let your child go and explore. Let your child work here for six months and work here for two weeks and work here for, you know, 10 minutes and be like, actually, this isn't what I want to do because that's going to save you that money and that heartache in the long run. And I think we have to come out of this mentality that everything has to happen in this kind of back-to-back um, -back way. Um, and I think that's also something that's really important to identify when we're advising these young people. Yes, you didn't get those grades, 
it's okay to take a year out. Nobody says you have to go to uni when you're 18. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to also consider. Thank you, Andrew. Now I'm mindful so many panelists have, it's a hot topic, but I'm also mindful it's 18 minutes past seven. We're gonna end at eight o'clock. We, we still haven't answered the Q and A's for this um, second session and we haven't started session three. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to move on to Amaze. If you can tell us one or two of the most popular um, questions that came out from session two, and we can probably direct that to um, one of the panelists. Okay, um, so I'm just going to quickly, so there was a, just quickly, there was a link for Paula Perry's book, which I'll put in the chat box again, the Black British History book. Um, there was a question that said, for the experts, what does community of practice, community institutional relations look like in terms of addressing issues of racism, differences and other isms? In school environments, I know that's quite a meaty question. But if anyone has like something really quick to comment on that, can you repeat that question again? Yeah. Um, what does community of practice, community institutional relations look like in terms of addressing issues of racism, differences, challenges, and other isms that impact youth in school environments? I might answer that one really quickly and just say, um, actually, it becomes it comes down to what we have in our hands, and that every single uh, every single one of us have a sphere or area of influence, and that's what we go after. I think expecting the system, which uh, is part of the problem, to change part of the issue that can't be done. So if you've got a youth group, if you've got, you know, a church, if you've got a community thing, even it doesn't even matter, even if you just know young people, you can be instilling and correcting change um, and information as well about themselves and about their society at, at large. Uh, parents, you can read, you can then educate your children, you can read alongside your, your children, have those conversations. So community has to be wherever you are, whatever, sphere of influence that you have that you're using that to bring about the change. Great, thank you Tyrone. And there were a lot, a lot, a lot of comments on uh, uh, pooling all this information. Um, I'll just read out one comment which echoes so many other comments. Our community needs to know where to look. Google is great but sometimes information is not relevant or up to date. We need to be strategic about this and we need to make sure as a community that we are clued up so our children are clued up. It is life changing. You can't choose what you don't know about. So that's just a comment. If anyone wants to, um, if think, anyone has any information on that, or I think definitely what we've learned from this discussion so far is about collaboration. And sometimes we are not. Um, we want to be the Lone Ranger. Um, so I think definitely collaborating together um, to pull the knowledge. Um, I'm happy to work with all the people here and and others to to see how we can facilitate this and put our brains together to try and pull that knowledge to support our communities and um make sure that that knowledge is dispensed where it's needed does anyone else want to add anything okay, okay. right um nigel can we show slide four for session three You're muted, Emma. Thank you. Um, session three, we are going to be looking at study skills and learning techniques. Um, also, we're going to be focusing on STEM, so academic achievements in science and STEM subjects, and also representation of, and access of Black people in academia, um, scientific research, and STEM careers. Um, we've we've seen all these panelists before so I won't um, go on to just um, read their bios if we can scroll down to the next next slide of, um, for the panelists please Nigel okay I think there was another slide above uh, okay 
All right. Um, so I'll just read um, this quote out. Okay. Um, it says, in the 2016 and 2017 data of those working in higher education institutions show an underrepresentation of academic staff from all UK born ethnic groups, notably from black and Muslim groups. There is an overrepresentation of non UK national staff from Chinese, Indian, and black African groups compared to the low representation of non UK staff from Bangladeshi, black Caribbean, mixed, and other black groups. Um, that source was from the book Ethnicity, Race and Inequality in the UK, State of the Nation um, 2020, published this year. Um, and also, um, there was an inquiry into the equity on STEM education. Um, and one of the quotes from that, that report said that a school, the school's role in GCSE option selection is, is leading to inequity, especially in the most disadvantaged areas. So I think here they were talking about the fact that some schools may, it, it may not be that every child has access to pick triple science and that may have an impact on whether that child can go on and study um, sciences in their A levels. So um, again, when we talk about inequality, it's about other students from disadvantaged backgrounds you know, how, how are they being limited in, in how far they can go within their educational journey because of inequalities or because of the, um, the disadvantages, the disadvantaged school that they may be in. Um, moving on to uh, the panel discussion. Dr. Aisha, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so um, Dr. Aisha, you prepared um, some tips that you wanted to share with the audience about um, studying and preparing for STEM subjects, particularly for the students. Nigel, if we can get that those slides up and then we can, Dr. Aisha, just go through that for us. Yeah, because I don't have them on my screen. I'm on my phone, so the slides we'll would be great. Uh, just while the slides are coming up, just so people know who I am. So my name is Aisha. I'm a paediatric trainee. Um, I'm working in the West Midlands. Um, I'm from London. Um, I've been here for 10 years um, and my route into medicine was quite long-winded so I um, always knew I wanted to do medicine sort of from the age of about four um, and when it came to GCSEs and A levels I really struggled a couple of reasons one I didn't actually go to primary school for very long and that's a long story that I won't go into but um, while I had a really strong maths and English background science was something I struggled with right the way through school um, during my schooling in the UK um, so you know when you think of year six sats I you know that was my lower grade and year nine sats it was my lowest grade um, and I got A's in GCSE um, and when I got to A level um, and I said I wanted to do medicine as other people have already alluded to and I think times I think have changed but I was pushed into doing the three sciences and maths um, which is not something that I wanted to do. It was something that was kind of forced forced on me or, you know, strongly encouraged for me to do. And actually, the way the subjects were organised within my sixth form, there wasn't really much remit for me to do anything else. Um, and I, I really, really struggled. So I didn't get the grades to get into medical school first time and ended up doing a, a degree and then postgrad medicine. Um, so I just want to talk about, I guess, some of the some of the tips that I've come up with are, are kind of based on that experience. Um, yeah. So you can get the slides up again because they've just disappeared. Um, so I think the first thing in terms of su success in the science subjects compared to your English, compared to everything else, you really have to be persistent, um, and persistence is is key. Um, I think in terms of when you're choosing A-levels, I think that's already been alluded to, um, think about your options. So um, medicine being an example, you don't have to do three sciences and maths. Um, that's a common misconception. Um, we spoke about BTECs. I am not up to date with how BTECs work with application to med medicine and dentistry. As far as I'm aware, medical schools will still only look at A-levels but you could do biology and chemistry together because they go hand in hand and there's a lot of overlap between the subjects and transferable skills and transferable knowledge. Um, it's the same for maths and physics. There's a lot of transferable knowledge and skills that apply to both subjects. So you could do 
biology and chemistry and then English or a social science so sociology for example or history or psychology which isn't necessarily typically you know a hard considered a hardcore science but actually your those skills and the things that you're going to learn will actually be beneficial to you not necessarily in medical school but later as a doctor because you have to study psychology and psychology um, and those wider things um, you know i did second time around because i reset my levels i decided i was going to do biology chemistry and art um, and that gave me a creative outlet that was non sciencey that allowed me to thrive and survive in sixth form which for me was a really hostile environment um, I think think about yeah think about the other things that you're going to get from your subjects as well so uh, the things that you need in terms of success for STEM not just at university but in your career it's generic skills so it's your reading your writing your communication um, when em what employers are looking for it's problem solving so medicine is about problem solving engineering it's about problem solving it's about looking at the information that's put in front of you from a customer, from a patient, from a client, and using your knowledge and your skills to solve that problem. Um, so again, if, when you're thinking about your A-level subjects, you know, if you want to do engineering, you don't just have to do maths, physics, and, you know, and chemistry, you, you can do other things. Um, and again, my knowledge isn't necessarily up to date with that, but there are lot, there's lots more information around and university specifically will will tell you what what they will accept and, and what they won't in terms of qualifications so if you already have an idea about what university you might potentially want to go to to study a subject go onto the website and look online and see what see what you know what what is acceptable um, and, and what things they'd be willing to accept in terms of subjects um, so you know some might, one might say specifically for medicine you know we don't count maths i don't think there are any but just you know just as an example um and i think as has already been mentioned by by some of the other students as well when you are studying these subjects at a school level it's really important to develop those study habits early um and kind of understand that you need to take responsibility for your own education um for me personally I, I struggled through A level just because I just I just didn't get it. So I I resat my this has been in the days of ASs and A levels. Um, I resat my unit for chemistry four times, and I got a C every single time. Um, and some of that was just to do with exam technique, exam anxiety. Because I would come back from that exam and my teachers would look at my grade and go, Aisha, what are you doing? Because I was, they told me like I was the best person in the class. I just couldn't do the exam. I couldn't do the exam. Um, and, you know, that's, it, it, you know, as people have said, these exams, they're just a hurdle to jump through. Because actually once I finished and I got to university, like I graduated from Warwick University with a first. Um, you know, just because of how I performed in A levels at one period in my life, it's not, I allowed it to define me, but actually it had no bearing on my future trajectory. It, it, it slowed me down for a time because it meant that I couldn't go to medical school at 18 um, and I had to do another degree. But actually, and I didn't appreciate it at the time, the things that I got from my first degree while I was sat there. And I'll be honest, miserable a lot of the time because I wanted to do medicine and I felt like I was doing this degree that was a waste of time was so, so, so valuable. So my friends for life are from my first degree, not from medical school. Um, I had opportunities to travel in my first degree that I didn't have at medical school. I had opportunities to teach and meet people from all over the world in my first degree that I didn't have from medical school. Um, so when we kind of talk about, you know, before, you know, not necessarily maybe getting the grades you wanted or not going to the university that you wanted that was your first choice. I did my second choice degree at my, my fourth choice university. Um, and do you know what? Since that unit four chemistry, I have not failed a single exam since, like not one. I get throughout my undergrad and medical school, I never got less than 75% in any assessment. Um, and so just, just as an example to you that, you know whether you got B's and C's in your GCSEs, whether you 
were downgraded because of this government disaster that I don't have time to go into. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't define you. Every exam and every assessment that you do, that you sit, is just a stepping stone to get you to the next step. Okay, and once you're at that next step, like no one asks me what A-level grades I've got now. No one cares. It's not, it's, it's not, it sounds silly when you're, when you're in it, it's the most important thing and qualifications and education are so, so important, but you need to recognize them for what they are, which is a stepping stone. So you just need to keep your head down and do what you need to do and keep your, as, as has already been mentioned, keep your eye on the goal. So for me, my goal was I want to be a doctor and I never let anything distract me from that. So even when I had setbacks, my, I knew where my trajectory was and it was about, okay, well, I haven't got the grades now, so what are my options? I can reset, I could go to university, I could do another degree, I could take two years out and go and do something else. Um, I definitely think, again, as has already been mentioned by other panelists, information is so important and having people that can give you good advice is really important. Um, if you move to the next slide, I've got a couple of things in terms of, oh, the next, the next one down, sorry. Um, yeah, so these are just some really basic examples of places where you can find support. So I think the one thing, if you're struggling academically with your handle on whatever subject you're study, studying in STEM, um, the internet is much better than it was when, when I was at, at sixth form. So YouTube was not a thing, Facebook was not a thing, Instagram was not a thing. Um, and there's a lot of great information out there. So these are a couple. So S-Call, which is the one in the corner, was from back in my A-level days. It's very primitive, but they do very, very good summaries um, on most subjects. But the, the biology, chemistry and physics is particularly good. Um, just above that in the, uh, the next corner, um, Dr. Brown's science website, again, has got really, really good, concise summaries that covers most of the UK exam boards. The interface is really primitive. Um, but the information is really good. So that's a really good place just to kind of go and refresh your knowledge. Sometimes you just need somebody, somebody to explain something to you in a different way for it to go in. Um, I've not got an affiliate association with CTB books, but I'm sure most people, you know, have got them. They're really, really good. Um, when I teach um, even sort of first year students now, I go back to my old A-level books. They're really concise and really, really good. So if you have bought another textbook and don't have this one yet, I would, you know, find someone that's got it secondhand or, or purchase them. They're really, really good. Um, osmosis, particularly if you're doing biology and chemistry, they do really, really useful um, video summaries that you can just sit and watch and learn passively. Um, it's mainly sort of directed at medical students, but a lot of the basics, they have a lot of basic science that will be relevant to sort of your biology and A-level chemistry students. Um, and guys, don't forget your school. Um, I know we kind of, you know, teachers are busy, but your teachers are on the whole willing to help you and want you to succeed. Um, I didn't make enough use of my teachers. You know, I remember being at school and my teachers kind of saying, oh, you know, you know, if you ever need help, you know, you can always come and find me in this period X, Y, and Z. I didn't, you know, I didn't do it. Um, I did it towards the end, second time around when I was resitting. Um, and they were so willing to just sit down. You know, I would sit in the back of, um, my, one of my teacher's lessons while he was teaching his year nine science group and I would sit in the back and study and at the end of it I'd come up to him and say oh sir can you look at this um, and you know they were always willing to help me so use that resource um, I don't think it's something that we do enough um, I, ne I never stayed late and went to science club because um, that just wasn't the thing that you did like why you know if school finished you want to go home and watch tv or or do whatever but please please make use of your teachers um, they do you know they do care about you, they do want to help you. Um, I think Mike mentioned earlier about the tutor option as well. Um, again, when I was at school, that wasn't really something I felt I could access from a financial point of view. But if you, know, if you need it, I would say, just try it, try it for, like Mike said, try it for a term. It might just give you that extra boost that you need just to push you over the edge. Because um, once you've got, got through to that next step, you know, you've got another challenge ahead of you. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of all I've got to say about that. Um, and, and careers in science and engineering and medicine are, are really rewarding. Um, 
you know it's 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 the kind of at the forefront of technology things are always changing um and the other thing to bear in mind with these careers not so much medicine but especially kind of your engineering computing is not just to, not just to follow the status quo um because if you think sort of 10 years ago you know youtube wasn't a thing vlogs were not a thing so we're trying to train or what the aim is to we're trying to train you actually and to develop careers that don't exist yet um and that's also why i try and encourage students to to pursue creativity as well as your science because that's where you're going to get the ingenuity the entrepreneurship to kind of develop jobs and and come up with new ideas um to solve problems that we don't know we have um yeah so that's that's the end of my little spiel thank you aisha thank you thank you so much there were so many um so much so many pearls of wisdom that you shared also um sharing you know the experience that you have that you know that you have personal experience of um is so useful and inspiring but also it gives people a blueprint of how to navigate situations that they may be facing because oftentimes our, our challenges come and we don't have access um to people who can show us the way or people who have gone through that that pathway before and i think what you said um followed on so nicely from what was said earlier about alternative routes and not having to be so rigid in the ways in which we um, try to pursue a, a particular career. Um, I'm going to now go to Dr. Michael and um, Dr. Michael, if you're still with us, I wanted, Dr. Michael, are you there? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about, I mean, this is to kind of tie up our panel discussion for this session and for this conference before we speak to William and before we give a bit more opportunity for q and A. I wanted to ask you about your experiences being a black British Caribbean consultant, medical consultant. Um, what are some of the challenges and barriers to entry? You know, some, we've been talking about inequalities within education at secondary school level, um, sixth form college, university, and then sometimes we may feel that you get to a certain stage and you've arrived, but can you elaborate a bit on that? Um, not just necessarily your experiences, but what is the data showing um, about access to these positions of leadership? Um, and also, just in terms of anecdotal evidence and your own personal stories like the the uber stories the uber stories that you were telling me about where you meet these uber drivers can you elaborate on these points as we tie up this this session yeah sure um essentially with the medical training it, it seems like it's a ladder and it's just quite straightforward you do your exams you qualify you you turn up you obviously don't do any harm and you, you keep learning and you should really just keep moving up the ranks. There's a few exams or quite a lot of exams even after you've qualified. And in my area, I'm a psychiatrist. So within psychiatry, what I noticed is there's a crucial exam you need to do about four to five years into your post uh, medical qualification. And that's to become a member of the kind of society of psychiatrists. And that's a really tough exam. And part of that exam is a face-to-face -face exam. So you're, you're kind of showing your skills with actors. And so it's quite subjective. So th there's a certain style which is kind of accepted as this is how a psychiatrist should assess. And this is how you should speak. And this is how you should elicit the information from the actors. And it's, it became quite well known that lots, it's a very hard exam. Only like 50% of the people that take it pass first time and it keeps becoming a 50% of all the same level of people pass. But the statistics were showing that if you're from an ethnic minority, or if you didn't train in the UK, in a UK medical school, you're much more likely to fail. And so that was initially a lot of the kind of ethnic minorities felt that maybe they, they almost had a, a, par a kind of feeling that maybe it was them and that was because they hadn't trained in the UK. So they almost felt inferior to the UK trained doctors. But it happened so often that actually people were looking into it and they did find actually there was a bias to just how you communicated. So of course, communication is crucial for psychiatry, but it was beyond that. It was more of a cultural bias 
in the way that you interact with the actor. And actually in, in my field, you work in various different communities and actually there is not a specific style. It really depends on what community you're, you're dealing with and you need to be quite open to that. So there's definitely a barrier at that stage and that's the crucial level. This is three years before you become a consultant. Once you've done that exam, that really gives you the passport to continue on and become a, there's no final consultant exam. It's the exam three years before. So it's a little bit invisible um, but it has been recognized. It, it's in the news quite often, but actually they haven't quite found a way to, to address it because it's a long-standing, almost bias that people hold. And for example, myself, I just adapted my style. I'm a bit of a chameleon and I adapted my style to what they needed to do. And I managed to get through, but if, you know, not everybody can, is able to do that and it's actually quite unfair. Um, and then what you find is a lot of people are, are quite old, they're a bit, bit older than me, but they stay at the kind of middle grade level. They don't actually, they get disheartened. They failed it maybe three or four times. It's expensive to take the exams. You're working, you're studying. It's a very, very challenging period. You can't sustain it over, can't keep repeating the exam. And then they end up having a temporary position where you're not going to be like a leader or you're not going to be at the consultant level. So you can't actually influence at that higher level with you know there are different commissioners there are different management people you're never really you're almost invisible because you might be a temporary member of staff or an agency worker you might be earning a good salary but in essence you're just temporary and you're not actually part of the the fabric of the organization um, and that does have a trickle down effect so teaching academia usually you are a consultant and then you would, as part of your consultant contract, you'd have a university contract and you would do teaching, you'd do lectures, you could do research. But really there is that gap three years before where a lot of black people and a lot of people from ethnic minorities end up settling, I, I'd put it as settling because of their situation. Um, so that is a challenge. I haven't really found solutions other than having to adapt and anticipate that. Um, but it really does come down to those examiners appreciating the cultural diversity and the different approaches that a psychiatrist can have. It's not a fixed approach to relating to the actor because it's, it's actually an artificial scenario. It's not based upon a real, a real person either. So there's a scripted way you, you have to go through that exam under pressure. And if that's not your natural way of communicating, it's much harder. Um, so that's, that, that probably happens in other areas of medicine, but particularly psychiatry, because it's such a relational kind of around communication uh, under pressure um, as well. So that, that's been challenging. I think now I'm a black consultant, there's such a shortage of child psychiatrists, to be honest, actually doesn't matter what background you're from, once you're a consultant in child psychiatry, they will take you because it's just such a shortage, even at the top institutions now, it's not like it was maybe 10 years ago. Um, so that's not such an issue. It's really getting past that middle grade level where you do your final exam to be a specialist in your, in your field. And just to touch on your experience with, you know, I've had it as well, being a doctor coming from a shift and then you get into the Uber car and what the conversation is like and how you can relate that to this discussion that we've been having, just to kind of conclude our discussions for today. Yeah, I do get a lot of Ubers. I'm involved in a lot of sports as well. So sometimes I might be like I am now in a kind of sports talk and I might get into the Uber. And of course, you know, there's a high proportion of low income workers who are Uber drivers or from black or Caribbean backgrounds. And they'll ask me, oh, what are you doing? They might think I'm a coach, but of course I'll tell them I'm a doctor. And I just tell, and you can always tell their reaction because even though, of course, they're from the same background and they have a conversation, they're quite, I'm always struck how surprised they are because I'm quite used to it within my family. But they kind of always remind me that in a way I'm a bit privileged now in the sense that I've had a lot of opportunities and, you know, they ask so many questions. They want to know, you know, what was it like? How was it for you? They talk about their children and they are really trying to get their children involved in sport and education. And there's lots of stages where they work. There's a balance between them working really, really hard to have enough money to provide 
usually it's male, male drivers, but also at times they feel like they're losing their children as well through the culture, through society, through their friends, through video games. You know, so many distractions which maybe were a bit less intense when I was a child. Um, and I think that is always the challenge for each generation to look after the next generation, but we weren't in the same environment as them. So I, I had video games, I love video games, but no one played video games for the whole day. Whereas when I talk to parents, that is quite a normal thing that you don't know if that child's got a problem because that, that's kind of normal to play a video game for the entire day and maybe come to dinner. Um, because the technology is so immersive, so entertaining, and you can communicate to your friends. So, you know, you can't necessarily distinguish as a parent what is um, where your boundaries should be. And I think it's a challenge for me as a psychiatrist because actually I'm dealing with the severe end when actually there's many, many levels way before that, which, um, so when I speak to the Uber drivers, all I kind of explain to them is the importance of my parents, so my mum, but also I lived in the Caribbean for a couple of years at crucial time just before secondary school. So I think that's why I don't see everything as well as maybe I should, I, because I always saw the doctor, the police officer, everyone was looked like me. So I never had, when I came back to England, I always said I wanted to be a doctor like my GP, who was white, but that wasn't a big deal to me because in my head, I suppose, I'd already seen a society where that was normal. Um, and I could tell maybe a teacher would not be quite sure, they'll be nervous for me applying to medical school, or it could be uh, my mum even saying, are you sure you want to apply for that? You know, it's gonna be really hard. But I'd already had a bit of a foundation in seeing people do it. And, you know, they treated me as a doctor in the hospital when I was a child. So I think that it's good to read books. And I had a lot of other uncles and aunts that had a lot of books and they were quite almost, I felt a bit over the top with the information they were giving me as a, as a young person. But what really got me was seeing it for real rather than reading books. After a while, I switched off from all these examples because yeah. it wasn't really real enough. Um, so speaking to the Uber drivers, I think just speaking to them and them listening to me and hearing me and me hearing them gives them a lot more hope and a lot more belief. So just having these sorts of conferences, it might not be really technical, but actually it's just knowing that we all exist yeah. at all these different levels. I wasn't always like well-spoken and articulate. I was quite a hyperactive, sporty child who'd be running on the tables. And I probably was labeled as someone who would just be a footballer or a nobody. Mm -hmm. Actually, we're not one dimensional like us all, you know. I remember you talked about your, your kind of background in your video. Yeah. And maybe people within our own culture would even label you as someone who's just going to end up with maybe the wrong choices. But actually, we develop at different paces. Definitely. And we, we all have potential. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. And um, I could see there was um, some discussion in the chat with um, a young lady. Um, and I, I would hope that I know some people have been answering her question. Um, I would like us to, um, before we go to Margaret's question, um, if I can go to you, William, and ask you what, what tips and what encouragement would you give to um, some young people who are maybe a year or a couple of years younger than you um, and you know you're, you're on the trajectory where you are doing really well in, in these A-level subjects you've gone on to the Amos bursary it might be good for you just to explain a little bit about what that is the Amos bursary and what tips would you then give to somebody else coming after you like Margaret who um, wants to know how they can not only um, excel in the subjects they're studying at school, but have a well-rounded um, extracurricular um, activities as well? Um, I, would, I would say, especially when you're younger, to keep maybe your options open, um, experiment. So not going down one route of success, there's like multiple routes to take. So maybe, you know, when, when you're in your studies, maybe try out something, maybe like an internship in marketing or 
maybe try to go to a hockey club or things like that. And that's how you start picking up your interest. Um, in regards to um, maybe GCSEs or A-level studies, I would say it's very good to know your specification, um, in particular for the science subjects, because the specification outlines what you actually need to know. So what I did personally, I would go through that make flashcards and then after I, I recall all the knowledge um i would do exam practice um because um for the science subjects and maths stem in general you have to be um persistent and resilient um especially because i know i've been through a lot of difficulties with uh, with um with science in particular but it wasn't always easy easy for me but me just doing active revision not just passive revision, don't just take a textbook and read it because you're not really retaining anything and you're not really improving on yourself. So just make sure your revision is active um, and also surround yourself with the right people because I find that, especially in secondary school, there, there are a lot of like distractions um, and who you surround yourselves with, uh, with um, they also have an influence on you. Um, there's a quote where it's like, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. So make, making sure you're surrounded by the right people, um, that you have a good social, like you have good people around you who can support you, good people to talk to. Because um, especially, let's say, because everyone has their bad days. Um, if I didn't have a good exam, um, I would often find a lot of closure talking to my mum uh, about it. Uh, mom, I had a bad day at school. Um, it did, the test didn't go how I like it. I, I'm I, like for me, performing bad in bad in exams was like an embar embar embarrassment. Um, but I had to quickly change that and realize that <laughs> an exam paper doesn't define my ability, and I'm more more than capable of achieving higher and better things. So it's also about your mindset and being resilient when you. When you're um, when you're faced with failures, not letting that defi define you and get to you. Um, in regards to the Amos bursary, so the Amos bursary works with disadvantaged um, young boys, um, black boys, um, and they offer them professional uh, guidance and personal um, improvements. Um, and what I found about the Amos bursary is that there's um, there's a huge, there's a huge variety of students, people doing um, economics, engineering, medicine, different types of routes, and I found in general it's very, it's very impactful when, as a younger person, when you see someone um, like you who's who's succeeding, because especially with all these stereotypes, it's very easy to, you know, uh, say, uh, people think I'm just going to achieve this. Why do I? Why why should I bother? But no. Um, you know, look up to them and really um, draw your inspiration from them because that's where you want to be. Um, and yeah, that's what I would say for that. Thank you, William. Thank you. Thank you, panellists. Amazing. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Um, and if you can highlight one of the main questions that may have come up and maybe um, some of our panellists may be able to help with answering that. Okay, um, so a question for Aisha. Why did you want to become a doctor? Briefly. You're muted, Aisha. Um, I said it's not a question I can answer briefly. Oh, okay. um, the interview answer that I gave was, um, it was a childhood ambition reinforced by life experience. Um, that's a good line if you want to use it. Um, I can't remember a time where I didn't want to be a doctor, I think is probably the easiest way to put it. Um, and I think when people talk about role models, um, so as a kid, <laughs> my favorite my favorite person in the whole world was Dr. Chang, who was, he was Chinese, not black, but he was our like GP kind of local. And I, I just used to love going to see him and I admired him a lot. Um, and it's just something I always wanted to do. Um, people who've known me since childhood can remember me running around saying, oh, I'm going to be a baby doctor when I grow up, I'm going to be a doctor. So it's, it's just something I always wanted to do. Um, 
when I didn't um, get the grades to get in, I really had to do some hard thinking and reassess my options. Um, I did explore other things. So I explored teaching. I worked in research. Um, I did a bunch of other stuff um, and decided actually at the end of my undergrad that I, I still wanted to do medicine. I don't think it, that ever changed. Um, the thing that I will say about that is though that those, experience, that those experiences that I explored as potential other things I could do if I didn't get into medical school as a postgrad are actually things that now influence my career now. So as a trainee, I'm heavily involved in medical education. Um, I'm actively involved in a lot of research projects and those skills that I developed again during my first degree and during you know, work experience and, and trying other things have all fed into my, to my current career. Um, so again, like I said, in terms of setbacks, don't, I guess, don't try not to, and it's really hard, try not to despise the setback. Um, and like someone said, it's about then restarting from not a place of failure, but from experience. So what did I learn from, what did I learn from that experience? Um, and you, you might not realise it at the time, but, you know, you're, you're learning stuff and you're developing skills that are going to help you later. Um, so yeah, but in answer to why, did, why medicine, I, I can't think of a time where I didn't want to be a doctor. And I tried other things and I didn't like them as much. Thank you. And there was a comment to say that you should share this on YouTube as it will be an amazing <laughs> tool. Um, there was just another question, just one last question on um, where... Sorry, can I just pick up on that YouTube comment. Um, I work in a college um, and we do a lot of stuff. Um, somebody mentioned why, why is it in participation? This is all part of that in terms of helping students to transition to university. And I think all of that, that whole mini presentation that you did was absolutely amazing. And it's something that I would give to people in my office to be like, yeah, show this to your students. Um, because I, I, um, I run a foundation degree, so I was head of year one and two, and, and students just not knowing what to do to prepare for university is just such a big thing. Like, it's not, you have that in college, you can kind of talk that in college briefly, but a lot of college tutors don't understand the process, unless you're a careers advisor, and with funding cuts, a lot of that stuff just gets cut, like we have big, massive arguments in team meetings about what well you can't just make people redundant and not replace them um, and just through um just political kind of whatever it's so important and i think that little bit that you shared um you should definitely do something with that absolutely amazing uh, Sorry, thank you for that and um, andrea i'm just aware of time emma should i pass it over to you Yes, so thank you so much for everyone who registered, everyone who attended, those of you who have stayed the whole duration. Thank you. Thank you to every panelist. Thank you for, um, you know, our younger panelists, particularly um, Jordan and William. We really celebrate you. And I just want to say um, all the positive feedback that I've received during this process of organizing this event um, has been so encouraging. Um, this discussion doesn't end here and um, whilst I'm learning about social media and how to um, utilize that to continue conversations I will be in touch with you um, via email and we need to put our heads together all the panelists here were exceptional um, to put our heads together and how we can continue to create um, a resource that will empower um, our community um, if there's any last comments that any of our panelists want to make, the floor is open to you. Um, it is two minutes past eight, so be brief. Um, but thank you, everyone. And um, there was a PDF for the program with all the information about the panelists and how you can contact them that was put in the chat. Um, so do download that. Um, and also, um, you can get in contact with me by my email, um, which and I've sent you emails and I can I'll send you an email again. Um, sorry, just, just, uh, very, very briefly. Um, be uh, Young people especially, be very, very, very in, uh, specific about the feedback that you allow, that you allow to get in here. Um, I always tell myself, if, if I, oh, I want to also be very aware of what you tell yourself. I always tell myself, if I wouldn't take that from another person, I shouldn't be saying it to myself either. 
right? So be very, 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 very intentional about that because people have a lot of things to say, um, but ultimately, you know, you do not want to look back in X, in X amount of years time and basically say to yourself, do you know what? Those people were right. We have panelists who have been through, you know, who, who've, who've been, who glass ceilings have been put on them. And, and ultimately what they've done is they've said, okay, this is what I've lost, but also what can I gain here? Um, so there's something very practical about the way you think. And we've, we've, we talked a lot about resilience and persistence, but um, after this it's really important to look into how to be that, because that doesn't just come naturally at all. So something to research after this, that's it from me. Okay, so I think we will end there. And I want to say thank you to everyone. Have a good evening. Um, look out for an email from me with more information um, and we can continue this conversation there. Thank you again to our panelists. We really appreciate you. You um, are amazing. You're amazing. Thank you to all of our guests and who participated in the conversation in the chat. We appreciate you. We're grateful for your presence and for all the contribution that you've made to make the Student Success Formula Summer Summit 2020 what it is. And it was amazing. I've enjoyed it. I'm sure all of you have. So thank you. Good night. <laughs>